broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning, you're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. It's the post-Fed day. Uh, so there's a lot to discuss, lots to talk about. The big event risk was this one and it's passed and dare I say, in a very peaceful, smooth kind of a way. I'm Prashant Nair with me, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi, morning. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Good morning, morning. Nigel. And as they say, right, no news is good news. So there was no major news from the Fed, which yeah. means that it could be good news. And that's what the street is also looking at. Looks like it's going to be a good start to trade. Well, and let's keep an eye out on volumes. They've been quite tepid in the last few days. We've got a longer weekend that comes up. So let's see whether or not we see some pickup post this big event that's out of the way. Uh, you know, let's just uh, quickly tell our viewers what they need to know as they begin another session, right? So the message from the Fed was absolutely clear. Uh, it was straightforward. Uh, and in a straightforward way, it was dovish. Uh, and uh, I think that is uh, important. They basically are saying that uh, inflation is stronger, but stronger inflation, not just what they've seen, which is January and February, but further future stronger inflation than expected will not stop rate cuts. I think that is as clear as uh, it gets. Now, uh, FOMC, and this, is, this was the fear, right? There was, of course, no change in rates or anything. Nothing was expected. But the fear was that because of higher inflation in January and February, and persistence of inflation, the Fed in their projections, what is called the dot plot, could say we'll not see three rate cuts, but we'll see two in 2024. No change. They are still seeing, the dots still show that there are three rate cuts, a total of uh, 75, 25 each, 75 basis points, which the Fed itself is saying we, they will see or they expect to see in 2024. Uh, just one comment which I think stood out, and again, this talks to essentially the inflation print. January and February numbers were hot. And he essentially described them as, and I quote, bumps in the road in the disinflation process, which is inevitable. And I think uh, that uh, put the market's mind at ease that uh, even in the future, if inflation comes a little hot, uh, it's not going to be that big a problem, unless, of course, it's a really uh, ugly number. Markets themselves, so the Fed is saying 75 basis points, uh, by, if you look at the dots, the market, the swap pricing is now indicating an 82 basis point cut for the full year 2024. Uh, so uh, that is 882. You know, uh, the first cut is expected in June by everyone. Um, for the month of, for uh, the May meeting, there is only three basis points which is priced in, all right, in terms of rate cuts. Market pricing, three basis points priced in. And some are saying, well, you know, who knows, maybe we'll see something in May. And uh, the market needs to price that up a little bit. So, I mean, I think all that will pan out over the next few uh, days and few uh, weeks, so as to speak. Now, you've got basically the uh, equity indices, which were up. So the S&P 500, which was up about 0.9%. The Nasdaq was up about one and a quarter percent uh, as well. The 10-year lost about one basis points. We ended at about 4.2%, uh, 2.8%, uh, uh, not very different. I mean, right, uh, nothing large in that sense. And it's kind of held on to gains. Uh, as it often happens that, uh, you know, day two, day three, etc., are more important once the market fully digests what's happened. Dollar index, though, was a more pronounced uh, reaction. It ended about a third of a percent lower to about 103.24. Oil is uh, seen a bit of a pullback. I would say it's more technical rather than fundamental. There was no news flow, but it, it uh, fell about one and a half percent. There was the April WTI expiry as well, and maybe that uh, at, at the margin had an impact. So more technical in that sense. 86 is where oil is. It was heading, uh, it was above 87 at the same time yesterday. Now to kind of circle back and tie in the levels. Yesterday was an absolutely flat close, but if you only were watching the market at 3.30 or later in the day, you would kind of miss out the incredible volatility that we had through the course of the day. You know, uh, three, 400 point swings up and down, at least in the Nifty Bank. I mean, actually in percentage terms, we saw one and a half percent moves twice over in the course of a single trading session. And by close, it was nothing, absolutely flat. Uh, for the Nifty, and I was saying this yesterday as well, short-term indicators, there are many short-term indicators which are pointing to a bounce. I would still kind of say that a bounce is due, it's lurking around the corner. The Nifty uh, needs to take out, these are all hourly averages, the first two are hourly averages, 21,904 and 21,985. Uh, these are the uh, 20 and the 40 hourly averages. And then the 61.8% of the fall is 22,214. You need to get past these levels, then we'll start to talk about higher levels. It'll give confidence for bulls to come back. And of course, the recent low is 21,710. That should not be broken on the way down. Bank Nifty saw, the, saw a close which down for the ninth straight session. I mean, again, here, 
Uh, there is a retracement which is due. The resistance there is the 40 hourly average, which is 46,600. We left off at about 46,300 or so. I think the picture has gotten a little clearer from the global perspective, uh, really speaking. Uh, but, you know, the issues here in India has, have largely been centered around, you know, the broader market, small caps, etc. Uh, but I think it gives us a good pathway, good visibility uh, that, uh, you know, they're not, that they're not going to be nasty surprises from a policy action perspective, especially from the Fed and other central banks. 170 points higher on the GIF Nifty. I mean, it's indicating a big gap up. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. A big gap up. Mm. And, uh, you know, the sell-on rally that we were talking about last few days, that will be tested today, right? Yeah. Because that is the... That was the narrative of the market in the last many days that this market has now turned from buy on dips to sell on rally. But that will be pretty much tested today. So it's going to be a very interesting day of trade. As you said, the gift nifty is suggesting a big opening. Now, the US markets had a very strong rally after everything was maintained. The Fed maintained rates, did not move on rates. Also, the Fed reiterated the expectations of three rate cuts this year. The Dow was up 400 points at a fresh record high. Not just that, the Japanese market is at a fresh record high as well. It uh, hit, uh, you know, it rallied substantially overnight. So the going has been good. The Fed not only reiterated expectations of three rate cuts this year, they also raised their GDP expectations for the full year to 2.1%. So a lot of positives came through from the meeting yesterday. Uh, the Nifty has been holding on to the 21,800 level. Uh, there was large selling by foreign investors yesterday. FIs sold about 2,600 crores in the cash markets, while DIIs, they bought 26, um, uh, 2,600 crores in the cash markets yesterday. So it was kind of even Stevens yesterday. Uh, the fall in crude is a sentiment positive for a lot of um, you know sectors like OMCs, etc., tyre companies. So just keep an eye out on some of these names. Brent slipped below that $87 a barrel mark. And gold has been moving up higher. So, you know, uh, that is one asset class that continues to do very well. But this morning, uh, with Wall Street indices at lifetime highs, with our own markets, not too bad, uh, holding on to 21,800. Looks like the going is good. But let's see, it has been a sell-on rally market. Does that theory get tested today? We'll find out. Well, yesterday, in fact, it turned into a buy on dips, right? Yeah. Because some of those technical indicators, they did get stretched. But let's highlight the three broad points that we're looking at today. The Nifty Bank, that's been a relative underperformer and that's been correcting for the last few sessions. So can it give up its underperformance? Can it th break its losing streak? Point number one. Point number two is the Nasdaq and various IT-related stocks did well overnight. So can it have a bit of a rub off on the IT pack? Oh, yeah, and can the IT pack participate? If both those two queues go in favor of the bulls, then the Nifty is set to move ahead and, you know, break that 21,950-odd mark. The gift Nifty is suggesting that we start above those levels. We need to build onto that mark as well. For the time being, in fact, yesterday we did see a good recovery from around the 21,700-odd mark. The cash market volumes, we've been mentioning this, they are absolutely very, very tepid in comparison to the averages. So if you look at it, the last three sessions, you've only seen around 80,000 crores approximately, 80, uh, 80 lakh approximately. And in fact, you know, on an average, it's much higher. So the volume have been nearly around 20% lower than what we normally see. The net short positions, that as well has moved up drastically. So from around 30,000 short contracts, that moved up to around 60,000. And yesterday, there was an addition of close around 10,000 contracts on the net short side from the FIS table. When that number gets to around 100,000 out, sometimes you see a very big bounce. Part of that did take place yesterday when it reached close around 85,000 contracts. So net short market, that could be the reason that we see a bit of a bounce. The Nifty Bank, that's seen a correction last nine sessions, down closer to 1,700 points. So yesterday as well, you know, showed signs that it doesn't want to go ahead and break that 46,000 odd mark. And that's going to be a crucial support zone. So to pull up the support zone, yesterday is low, 45,830. And the 100 DMA, that becomes very, very crucial on the downside. On the upside, though, is for starters, you'll want it to trade above the 50 DMA. You know, that's been uh, elusive as well. So you want to get and make a dash towards the 20 DMA. And similar is the case on the Nifty as well. The 20 DMA is the crucial mark. But for the time being, going by this start that we'll like to see, you'll want to see some build on there. And the PCR yesterday went to an oversold level. Intraday it went to around 0.7. Now, because of the kind of options data that we saw, it's got back to around a 0.8 Todd. So let's get to the Nifty levels then. Yesterday's low, that's important on the downside. The 50 DMA, we are not probability we start a little above this mark, and then you want it to dash towards the 20, D 20 DMA. So the Nifty Bank holds the key today. It's been an underperformer. Can it break that losing streak? That's going to be the trigger for the Nifty to get past 
that 21,950 odd million. <clears throat> All right, uh, Nazim, thanks very much uh, for that. Well, that's uh, the uh, setup as we see it. Before we go any further, let's quickly tell you what's lined up here in the first half hour of the show today. We'll get you updates from markets across the globe. Uh, Peter Cardillo, Chief Economist at uh, Spartan Capital Securities, will join in uh, for uh, some quick views. Our research team gets us uh, the top stocks for the day, the 10 top names. At 8.30, we uh, get uh, Deepan Mehta, Director of Elixir Equities, for a fundamental uh, check on things. All right, on the equities, we have Eric Fishwick of CLSE who says that the Fed left rates unchanged at its March policy meeting. He says this was a given. Uh, the scrutiny was always on the guidance from the press conference and Fed's projection materials, which showed that the FOMC comprises of fewer doves than it did in December. But the central tendency forecast remains that the Fed funds rate will be cut three times this year for a December Fed fund ceiling rate of 4.75%. He says the Fed's guidance suggests that it is looking at a further three cuts in 2025, with the ceiling rate being 4% at 2025 end. Parul Mithil Sinha of Stancy weighs in on the uh, forex market. She says that the USD INR has moved higher, driven by do stronger dollar and unwinding of carry positions. She says limited participation from local banks has led to a weaker INR. Uh, she goes on to say that given the balance statement from the FOMC and the June rate cut expectations intact, she expects the dollar... INR a pair to trade between 83 point, uh, around uh, 83 to 83.3 to the dollar in the near term. Okay, and on the bonds, Parul says domestic bond yields overnight continue to trade closer to the repo rate on RBI's active liquidity management through VRS. She says while lower US yields are likely to have a salutary impact, concerns of yet another upside surprise on SDL supply is likely to keep the 10-year benchmark bond yield in a range of 7.05 to 7.15% in the near term. Okay. Well, we, have a lot of, yes. we have a lot of stock specific action to track for you. We get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. For the time being, we just run you through the list. TBS Motors, Wokart, RVNLGSW Infra, Prince Pipes, Crompton, PB Fintech, uh, Hinduja Global, Saxkin uh, Technologies, as well as ASM Technologies. All of them will be reacting to positive news. And it's that sort of a day. So we're expecting most of these stocks to react in the green. Peter Cardillo is Chief Market Economist at Spartan Capital Securities. He's joining us now to uh, sort of tell us what he's making of the things. Peter, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, two points. One, do you think that the Fed was sort of pretty dovish out there? They're basically saying that inflation could be higher than what, uh, exp uh, what, they, what markets expect, uh, but the process of disinflation is on and rate cuts are coming. I mean, I think... Uh, that was the key message. That is one. Would you agree with that? And uh, is there, I mean, uh, is, is, are there any nuances to watch out for? And second, yields did not move. I mean, the 10-year ten, ten was down just one, base, uh, one basis point. I mean, it's absolutely flat. The dollar didn't weaken last night. And equities went up, but nothing very large. Your thoughts, Peter? Yeah, well, you know, there's no question that uh, uh, that the, the Fed statement was basically unchanged from the previous one, and they um, then they stick to their script. There's no question about that. Uh, but the good news is that um, you know um, the dot plots is still signaling three rate cuts, and basically the message is. Uh, that, you know, while inflation, inflation remains elevated, uh, the Fed continues to believe that inflation will come down. And so I think that's the reason why we saw the markets respond in a very positive way. Um, I, I would also add to that, uh, add to the fact that, um, that uh, the majority of uh, Fed members uh, are still looking for three rate cuts. And there was maybe one or two that penciled in um, two rate cuts. So the, the, the essence of, of uh, the communique was uh, we are going to cut rates this year. And, you know, up until today, uh, the bond market was quite leery of that. In fact, um, we had a huge rally in yields over the past uh, several weeks. And that was due uh, to the fact that the market was expecting a scale, uh, a scale back on, uh, on, on future rate cuts. So all of that uh, today, uh, you might say, vanished in, in a sense that uh, the market made a, a, an about face. Uh, of course, yields didn't come down that very much because I think uh, the bond market is, is waiting for confirmation that inflation is 
headed back down. Um, mm. and, and I think another key point here was the fact that uh, Chief Powell uh, alluded to uh, the recent rise in inflation, uh, that it was due to seasonal factors. And so um, the bond market wants to be convinced of that. And I think once the bond market is convinced of that, then I think you'll see yields uh, reverse course. And uh, I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see the 10-year uh, go back down to the 4% uh, range. Okay. Uh, Peter, hi. Good morning and thanks a lot for joining in. So how are you positioned on emerging markets like India? Because the macro environment has improved substantially here, whether it's, you know, growth picking up, inflation has been pretty stable, earnings have come back and the equity markets have followed suit. But what is your prognosis now for the next 12 months? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, emerging markets are going to do well, just like uh, uh, the major markets are doing well. Um, in, in, in India has been a... Um, a particular situation in a sense that uh, uh, the economy uh, is likely to become the third uh, world uh, largest uh, economy. And uh, there's a good chance that uh, um, we're, that India might match uh, the Chinese eco economy and actually surpass it. So um, I think uh, the right way to be uh, at this time is uh, to be fully invested. If, if you're going to invest in emerging markets, obviously, uh, India is the first place I would bet. Okay, all right. Hi, Peter. It appears India's in this structural uptrend and the market looks good going by, you know, a stable government, the reforms that uh, are ongoing here in India as well. But in the near term, do you see a case that China does a relative outperformance? Because it's been a rank underperformer. Valuations there are reasonably attractive. And now some data points are suggesting that maybe, in fact, they're going to come out of the mess that they have been. Or would you just stick to the structural theme, which is India? No, I think that, look, uh, there's a, there has been some good news out of China recently, but um, uh, I think they still have a long way to go. Um, and, and uh, you know, they've uh, put a lot of money uh, into the economy. Um, they've kept interest rates um in a downward path and so uh when that happens uh, behind the scenes there are structural problems in india I, i'm sorry in china but um uh, you know uh, i i i don't think that china is ready uh to reverse its uh, to reverse the malaise that they have been in and i think that um you know uh, as i said before um india is uh uh, far ahead of uh, of growth as opposed to China. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think we still have some time uh, for China to get back on its feet. And 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 of course, the the, the biggest problem uh, has been and still is uh, the real estate. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate your thoughts here on CNBC TV 18. That's the word coming in on the Fed decision and the way forward. So the market has moved on. The Wall Street indices have closed at fresh record highs. That was a big rally overnight and looks like that's going to be the case for our own markets as well. But let's take a quick break. On the other side, our research team will be joining in to help us with the top 10 stocks that you need to watch out for today. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Plenty of stocks to talk about, so let's take it uh, straight to our research team standing by to give us a list of top 10 stocks. First up, I'm tracking TVS Motor this morning. The company has approved an issue of bonus preference shares. Now, this is in the ratio of four non-convertible redeemable preference shares for every one equity share that you hold. And this will be amounting to 1900 crores will be utilized from the general reserve of the company. So not just the bonus issue, the company has also inducted two new independent directors. Uh, we have uh, Vijay Shankar, who is the Sanmar Group Chairman and Shailesh Haribakti of Shailesh Haribakti and Associates will be joining in as the two new independent directors. The 
uh, the purpose of the board to do this is to enhance corporate governance standards and benefit from the expertise of the new appointments. So I reckon this will be taken very well by the street. The stock in any case has almost doubled in the last one year. It's been the strongest auto stock, uh, uh, the strongest two-wheeler name as well. So I'm going with green on TVS Motor. But Vivek has a bunch of stocks in the news for us. So Vivek, over to you. Well, good morning. You know, quite a few stocks are in focus on the back of Newsflow. First up, you know, pharma named Vocard will be in focus. The company has said that they are launching a QIP in order to raise funds. They have not yet specified the quantum of the funds they intend to raise, but the floor price for this particular QIP has been fixed at 544 rupees a share. So keep an eye out for Vocard. The second stock on the radar is RVNL. Some more positive news flow coming in. The company has emerged as the lowest bidder. Now, this is for building a rail electric traction system, and this is for Southeastern Railway. The total project cost is over. Over 167 crore. And lastly, keep an eye out for JLW Infra. The ports handle or the cargo handled by the ports is quite strong. The company has said that the total cargo handled on a consolidated basis has crossed 100 million metric tons. And this particular figure is, you know, given the fact that it has excluded the acquisitions that the company made in FY24 and also the cargo that has been handled on an operation and maintenance basis. So some strong volume coming in from JLW Infra. Uh, well, let's talk about more stocks with news flow. Uh, Upasana is here with that list. Upasana. Well, first up is Prince Pipes that will be on focus on the back of the acquisition. The company acquires bathware brand Aquil and the plant located at Burj Gujarat for 55 crores. Well, the acquisition will take place via an asset purchase agreement with Klaus Warren Fictures and Narshi Munji Shah for purchase of assets. Mind you that the acquisition belongs to the bathware and fitting industry. Well, second stock on my radar is Crompton Greaves Consumer. The company strengthens its footprint in the agriculture sector, securing four consecutive order for solar water pumping system from HAREDA that is Haryana under PM Kusum scheme and the total orders accrued till now under the scheme is almost 65.6 crores. Well lastly PB Fintech will also be in focus as the company to incorporate arm pb pay private limited to carry on the business of payment aggregator on incorporation of the pro proposed company the comp company will apply to rbi for payment aggregator license that's the reason even this stock will be in focus today we'll keep an eye on all of them uh, thanks a lot for that upasana but let's hop across to reema she's here to tell us some more stocks and the news morning reema Hi, good morning. So let me start with Hinduja Global, where the company has approved a plan to rationalize the supply chain of its media and media-related business to bring in operational efficiency. And a part of this step is to monetize their optical fiber assets for a consideration of 208 crore, which will go to bring down their debt. Uh, so good news for Hinduja Global, debt reduction on the anvil. Saskin Tech has gone ahead and acquired a 60% stake in Anoop Silicon for 38.5 crore rupees. Now, the company, you know, in the release says that as of now, there is no revenue for Anoop Silicon because they've not yet completed one year of a turnover. But this will help in the expansion of Saskin's and, you know, provide its growth plans. And finally, ASM Tech. It's a small company. Market cap is just about 1,000 crore rupees. They have announced a 170 crore fundraise of that 70 crore was already raised via a preferential issue and the balance will be raised over a period of time back to you okay thanks a lot Rima, for that well lots of stocks in focus in case you missed out on any years a quick recap uh, we're looking at tvs motor walkhart rvnl gsw infra prince pipes crompton pb fintech hinduja global saskin tech and asm tech that's on the radar on the back of positive news flow and there's no stock with major negative news flow today, so that's interesting. But there are some very interesting brokerages that, uh, you know, we have this morning. There are two companies on which uh, there's an initiate uh, coverage um, that's on Avenue Supermarts and on Motilal Oswal Financial. So interesting notes there. But uh, Sudarshan is joining in to get us up to speed on all of these names. Sudarshan, hi, good morning. Morning, Sonia. So first, I'll start with Bofa Securities on Bajaj Finance. It has a buy rating and target is 9,175 per share. It says stock D rating is overdone and valuations currently are now at 29% discount to five-year average and consensus earnings cuts are minimal. It says growth outlook is strong and it's factoring in 28% growth for FY25. 
Next is City on NMDC. It has a sell call and target is cut to rupees 180 from rupees 215 per share. It says global global iron prices have corrected from dollar 130 to nearly dollar 105 per ton, while companies' prices have remained unchanged and believes price cut is imminent. It says every rupees 100 per ton change in fines prices impacts EBITDA by nearly 4%. Last one is CLS, and CLS on Avenue Supermart or say DMART. It initiates coverage with buy call and target is 5,107 per share. It says there is an addressable market of more than $500 billion, of which less than 5% is organized. Private levels should drive the next leg of share gains and it sees DMART stores increasing over three times by FY, uh, FY34. Okay, all right, so Darshan, thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, let's get in Manisha as well. She's joining to tell us with a quick roundup of all the commodity action overnight. Hey, Manisha, morning. Morning, Nigel. Thank you for that. Well, uh, the commodities are reacting to the U.S. Fed indicating at least three rate cuts in 2024. This has led to a decline in dollar index and the treasury yields, and that in turn has been supportive for precious metals, where you saw gold prices hitting a yet another all-time highs above $2,200 per ounce. Silver gained up by 2.5% overnight. Metal prices also saw strong support in the overnight markets. You have copper, which is a percentage point on the higher side, and the Lagards, which has been the ferrous metals like iron ore and steel, are also half to 1.5% on the higher side. The only thing that has gone in for profit-taking has been the energy space. So whether it's crude, natural gas, heating oil are trading in the negative, but everything to do with metals, pressures, ferrous, non-ferrous, have started Asia on a positive note. Okay, thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, we'll connect with Dipan Mehta, Director Elixir Equities, for some stock talk. Stay tuned. LIC present... Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. We begin the day with lots of news flow. So, Dipan Mehta, Director at Elixir Equities, is joining us now to talk about that. Uh, Dipan, hi, good morning and thanks for joining in. You know, my colleague Sudarshan was just a while back talking about some brokerages and some interesting notes that they've put out. What stood out for me is CLSA is initiating coverage on DMART, where they talk about a $500 billion addressable market that DMART has. And less than 5% of this is organized. So, the scope is so large, right? But um, we've seen the ups and downs with this stock, Avenue Supermarts, that is. Uh, your thoughts here? Good morning, Sonia, and thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, I think the potential is there for everybody to see, and that's why it's attracting almost all the large players, like right, from Reliance to Amazon and some of the other quick commerce companies as well. Uh, but the issue is that, uh, you know, the base effect is coming into play for DMART, and I think investors are not completely in sync with their online strategy. And more and more purchases are going online. And uh, it seems that DMART is perhaps losing out on market share over there. And most importantly, so the valuations, you know, at uh, I think what 70, 80 times trading 12 months uh, with a growth rate, which can be at best around 10, 12% or so. I think the stock is a bit expensive at this point of time. And uh, when you want to play the consumption theme, I think there are cheaper options, maybe uh, even more high growth companies are there over there than DMART. So, you know, while it's a steady performer, and you may not lose any capital in it, but in terms of outperformance and generating the returns, I'm not so sure. Okay, all right. Hi, Deepan. Good morning and good to see you. When, uh, you know, in the last nine sessions, the Nifty Bank has failed to end the day in the green. I think that's good. Index is going to be in focus because it seems like at lower levels, we are seeing some kind of buying. From the banking pack itself, what is your preference as of now? Yeah, good morning, Nigel. I think you know, stick with the market leaders, you know, the likes of uh, HDFC Bank, ICICI, uh, to an extent, e even Kotak Mahindra Bank. If you look at their valuations at this point of time, they are amongst the lowest that I've seen in many, many years, uh, in, except when there was a crisis. So, And the growth rates are pretty much intact. It's just a matter of time before these, this tight liquidity condition is slightly eased. And the pressure which is there on deposits, uh, you know, that sort of kind of elevates. And then you will see net interest margin stabilizing. So very positive on the large cap for banks, NBFCs. <clears throat> I heard that story on Bajaj Finance also. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
that also is looking pretty interesting, I think, from a valuation and a risk return uh, profile point of view. So positive on all the larger banks where I feel that uh, earnings growth now will drive the stock price higher and earnings can easily grow at 15 to 20% for these large companies. Mm. <clears throat> uh, no, got that. Uh, Deepan, hi, good morning. Uh, so two uh, areas, one is autos. Yesterday, Aisha and Maruti and all uh, saw that big move. Uh, by the way, we'll play out some sound bites of Sajan Jindal talking about the, uh, you know, their venture with MG Motors. <clears throat> you know, and the, the Cybester is the name of the first pro, uh, the, uh, sort of automobile they're going to introduce in the market. And apparently, uh, source space information, but it should be around the fifth, uh, the price tag should be around 50 lakhs. Uh, just, just your thoughts on the space, the auto space. I mean, uh, you know, the, the one thing, of course, is what, the, what it does for the group. Uh, but uh, the other thing is what it does for competition in the space. Uh, your thoughts, Deepan? Yeah, Prashant, good morning. I saw the car and the first thought which came to my mind is, should I sell my auto shares and buy the car? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lovely looking car and it's a green car means uh, in the sense that it is environmentally friendly. And, you know, sports cars really, really haven't found any space in the Indian automobile industry the way it has in the developed market. So I think niche products like these have a great uh, potential going forward. But yes, I think... Uh, Automobile industry, long-term prospects are fantastic, but look at the valuations, I think. And at some point of time, base effect will come into play for these companies. Uh, a lot of these supply-related problems have been solved, so we are seeing this kind of volume growth. So eventually, even the booking period is reducing for a lot of auto companies. And valuations are pretty much fair, so I just feel that it's better to wait and watch at this point of time. But one auto company which comes to mind is M&M. I think, uh, you know, I think that it's from a valuation perspective, it is one of the more attractive stocks. And uh, their demand remains pretty much strong and products still find a lot of uh, excitement with consumers. And they also have a decent EV strategy in place, unlike Maruti, where we expect that something will be announced in the near future. So broadly, neutral on auto shares, but generally positive on M&M. And competition is there to is there in the auto industry, but you know the market also is steadily growing. So you know a lot of people, of course, looked at that car and said that oh this is amazing, but look at the price point, fifty five lakhs and all of that. Uh, I just um, a couple of days ago I saw the MG Comet, uh -huh. which is also an EV. It's the smallest one in that yeah. la list, and it's a it's a seven lakh price point. And now suddenly the MG Comet is all over the city. Yeah. And it's it's a fabulous car, I mean a green car, you know, small in size. So if so, this is something that is, you know, out of your budget, I mean something in which only seven, perhaps... Seven on road. Seven on road. Seven on road. Have the you sat behind Sonia in that it, car? No, I know it's, it is it is pretty small. It's a two-door car, so I mean, a, well, it, everything comes at a price, right? I sat right? in front, so. <laughs> <laughs> but the one behind was a little uncomfortable. But so. you know, the uh, um, the discomfort aside, the popularity of that car has yeah, picked up so much. I think it's the price point that's working, right? But anyway, at the sidelines of the JSW MG Motor Partnership launch event, uh, you have uh, the chairman and managing director, Sajjan Jindal, who confirmed to CNBC TV 18 that the JSW Group will be investing $10 billion in India's automobile sector. So there's definitely more competition coming in and more demand and more opportunities as well. He spoke about their steel and cement business uh, plants, their plans going forward as well. Listen in. The whole ecosystem over the next seven, eight years, uh, we would be investing close to $10 billion in the auto industry, in the new energy vehicles, including buses, maybe trucks tomorrow, uh, commercial vehicles. Uh, because I really believe that if India has to change and if India has to save its uh, uh, import bill on fuel and if it has to become Atmanirbhar on its own energy sources, then we have to move to the uh, new energy vehicles. We are uh, right now in, the five, in five verticals, steel, energy, uh, infrastructure, cement and paints. These are the five businesses that uh, JSW Group is involved with. Steel is the, is the primary mover. And uh, uh, now we are uh, 28 million tons and in next three months we are commissioning our uh, 7 million tons more capacity. So we'll go to 35 million tons uh, in the FY25. Um, so that, that is a, uh, a significant capacity and we are doing a brownfield expansion in our existing plants to take by the end of uh, 2030 we should be uh, close to 50 million ton capacity. That is our plan. Similarly, in the energy, we are really focused on um, our renewable energy and we are really pushing hard to build uh, uh, more and more capacity in the renewable. 
Our stated goal is that by 2030, we want to be 20 gigawatt renewable uh, company. In organic expansion, in terms of acquisition of a stake in NNBC, what about the cement business uh, listing? Cement, I, I think we are already planning uh, sometime this year. Uh, we would be uh, looking to do the IPO. Mm. Okay, well, uh, the cement IPO also perhaps uh, in the works. Uh, so there's a lot happening with the JSW Group. And we'll kind of get you excerpts of that conversation, wide-ranging interview uh, with Mr. Jindal, uh, both uh, you know, Mr. Jindal Sr. and uh, Parth Jindal as well, uh, that Parishit caught up with. Now, let's just quickly run through some of the other big movers, right? And, and one name, uh, Deepan, I think we've discussed this in the past, which I think you've liked, uh, we've not discussed recently, is Praj Industries. Had a very large move yesterday, uh, I think it was about 10% higher. And, uh, you know, at about 520, the high was about 650 or so. Uh, just just your thoughts if you if you uh, own it and if you have views on it. Yeah, Prashant, disclosure that we and our clients uh, have uh, investment in Praj Industries. And we generally like the story. And there was a blip when there were some uh, policy announcements around what can and cannot be used to, to convert to ethanol. And that sort of affected the order inflows, and it still lingers. But by and large, I think the long-term play in terms of uh, green fuels is certainly going to drive Praj Industries. And they have just about scratched the surface when it comes to exports, which has got a huge potential. Domestically also, they are a very strong player, very strong market share. But the stock does trade at premium multiples, and last two, three quarters, I think it has been below its potential. And even the order flow has not picked up as per our expectations. So while the long-term prospects are great, I think short to medium term, we may have to see some earnings volatility, maybe softer performance. So keeping that in mind, we are not actually selling off the stock, but nor are we buying, it's just remaining invested. And once we see a decent improvement in order flow, I think that could be a good entry point for Praj Industries. Right. Uh... Deepan, you know, stay with us. We've got a bunch of other questions for you, uh, but we have to take a quick commercial break here. So we'll do that. Uh, we are back uh, and, uh, you know, we'll tell you uh, what to uh, sort of uh, what's coming up. Anuj is, of course, going to be with us with that trade setup. And our technical experts will be with us as well uh, on uh, charts and the futures and options data with specific trading ideas. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, there's, what, 15 minutes to go for the pre-open session. The gift nifty is indicating it's going to be a good start. And why not, right? Uh, global markets are in good shape, up and about. And, of course, the message from the Fed is dovish. Anuj is standing by with what he's making of markets and the setup. Anuj, good morning. Morning, Prashant. And clearly, you know, what Fed chairman has said has fired up the market. And, uh, you know, it's election year, so the Fed chairman is also perhaps uh, recognizing that. Uh, now, the issue is, did we fall because of Fed? I think the answer to that is no. So uh, then the big question is, uh, why should we rally because of Fed? Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a big gap up. Uh, so let's see how, how it sustains. Because I think for today, it's not the market opening, but the market closing, which is more important. If today's rally doesn't sustain, it will be a big negative. But if you somehow manage to reclaim 22,135 and close above that, then I think that will mark the end of the at least the nifty correction. Anyway, the market is oversold and is due for a correction or due for a pullback. The FI long shot is a 31.69, put call ratio is 0.79. But of course, the real pain is in mid caps and small caps. And my sense is today the good PSUs might see big short covering rally today, especially the ones where we have seen indiscriminate fall over the last uh, few days or so. But, so that's something to focus on uh, in today's trade. Quickly coming to the setup, as I was saying, the long shot is now at 31.69. Uh, yesterday also 9,500 shots were added. And net, net, if you look at uh, the contracts now, we started 30,000 contracts short and now we are at 95,000 contracts. Uh, coming to levels now, on the Nifty, the first resistance is somewhere around where the market is likely to open. 22,022, the call writer's zone, today's weekly expiry. And then the bigger resistance is 22,125, the March 15 and 18 highs thereabout. So let's see if we are able to make a push towards that zone. Support after the gap up, first as 21,930, the recent uh, lows, which was the uh, swell support. And then the bigger support, 21,840, basically the neutral zone. Uh, not talking much about Bank Nifty because it's been quite volatile. Uh, Living with thought for the day, as usual, and today's World Poetry Day, by the way. So, a poetic <laughs> thought. Uh, 
the struggle ends when gratitude begins. Uh, Neil Donald Walsh, and that's something that uh, I have also used over the last one year, and the results have been fantastic. Wow, that's very, very interesting and a great takeaway for the day. So, stop struggling, guys. Every time when you <laughs> expect, you know, today is Monday, only four more days left, only three more days left. <laughs> have some be gratitude. Happy, be happy with what you have and don't, I mean, don't be, you know, don't, you, you might chase what you want, but uh, don't be unhappy about things that you don't have. Acceptance, right? Absolutely. It is what it is. Okay, thanks a lot, Anuj, for joining in and always leaving us with something to smile about. Uh, that's World Poetry Day today. Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani are joining in now to help us with some market ideas as well. Uh, gentlemen, morning to both of you. Sudarshan, let me start with you. Uh, looks like, uh, you know, the market is going to be grateful for the uh, US Fed because, uh, you know, in all likelihood, we'll open in the green. But do you think we can hold on to that? Because this has been a sell-on rally market for a while. How are you approaching it today? Yeah, good morning. I think we can hold on to the gains that are expected, uh, although uh, the markets may not be very willing to go higher in the morning. I would be a buyer here because the world markets are conducive. The Indian markets, they remember the Nifty yesterday went all the way down to 21,700 and then bounced back, telling, giving a message that at least for the time being, a selling climax has come in place and the lows are being likely to be held. So today is a very good day to go long. All right, got that. Good day to go long. That's the call from Sudarshan. Uh, let's get in Mitesh as well into the conversation. Morning, Mitesh. What about you? Morning, Najin. I think uh, I would agree with uh, Sudarshan when he said that today we can not only hold on to the gains, but we might actually be looking at building upon them as well. Uh, I've been bearish till now. And, you know, uh, yesterday, uh, towards late afternoon, there was the first divergence sign when the bank nifty stopped falling and we started getting a lot of buy signals on banking names. And we had Kotak Bank being recommended repeatedly during the day yesterday. So I think today you will see maybe banks take a mild lead uh, to begin with. And with that big gap of opening, there could be an immediate dip of about 40, 50, 60 points. But I would use that dip to, you know, possibly now look at some long positions, uh, particularly on the banking names and the bank Nifty itself. My sense on the Nifty is that in case, you know, we uh, sustain above this 21,950 levels, in a good case scenario, we might head towards 22,250 and then we'll take it from there. So for the timing, I think, you know, exit shots, uh, 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 if somebody is still carrying them and uh, try to look at financial names for taking long positions. Mm. <clears throat> Mitesh, uh, what would your trades be uh, on stocks? Morning, Prashant. I have uh, two banking names on my recommendation list. As I mentioned, I was just talking about uh, banks could lead the rally. So I have a buy on RBL Bank with a stop at 229.5 for targets of 244. Kotak Bank was a recommendation yesterday and then again uh, towards the closing uh, as well. But now I think can be bought a flesh with a stop at 1749 for targets of 1805. A buy on Reliance, which appears to have made a double bottom formation on the hourly chart. So 2870 being the stop loss, buy this one for targets of 2950. And Cubans India is a buy. Keep a stop below 2740, look for targets of 2900. And Sudarshan, what about you? What would your stock ideas be for the day? Well, I'll take the bearish one first. SBI cards is an intraday short, although I wouldn't go short today at all, even intraday. Anyway, with a stop above 721. The rest are all buying ideas. Bajaj Finance is finally a buy. You know, it had that mini bear market. That seems to be getting over Buy with a stop under 63, 67. Then I have Kotak Bank, uh, even with a chassis. A Kotak is a buying opportunity with a stop under 1689. Keep it a positional trade. There should be very good, a decent run up here. And finally, Sun Pharma is a buy. Sun Pharma is a, uh, I'm sorry, Sun Pharma is an intraday short with a stop above 1603. So two buys and two shorts, but focus on the buys. All right. Uh... You know, uh, come back to both of you in a bit. But uh, thanks very much, Sudarshan. Thanks, Mitesh, for running us through the view. And, of course, uh, the specific trades as well. Both essentially saying that, uh, you know, we should be able to hold on to gains and build on it, uh, maybe even. So, hopefully, uh, that perhaps is the case. Now, uh, Deepan is, of course, still with us. Uh, Deepan, uh, thanks for waiting. Uh, just your thoughts on Tata Chemicals, which uh, sold off aggressively. Now, of course, uh, it went up one way, right, from the 950-odd levels. Uh, on the back of all that buzz that Tata Sons is going to list. And then, of course, there was that uh, clarification that they'll do, they'll do their best to avoid that outcome. Uh, sharp cut, I think 8-9% lower. Uh, you think it'll completely retrace? And is there any sense in looking at the business, excluding this news flow? 
Yeah, you're right, Prashant. I think a lot of excitement around Tata Sun's listing, which you know causes a spike in the stock price. But now that's not going to happen, and especially after they have offloaded shares of TCS, clearly uh, the management thinking is to keep Tata Sun's private. So the shares which Tata Chemicals holds in Tata Sun's will remain just that. You know, it'll remain, uh, it won't it won't get unlocked per se. And look at the quarterly numbers, last two three quarters. Um, even even a year or so, Tata Chemical numbers have not been that exciting because it's a commodity business and there are a lot of overseas subsidies where there are a lot of moving parts as well. Uh, there was some uh, buzz that, you know, they would eventually become a specialty chemical player with focus on, uh, you know, the chemicals which go into electric batteries. But it's a small portion of the business. The large business is still driven by soda ash. And there's quite a bit of uh, earnings volatility because of uh, price volatility in the end products. And valuations are not really attractive, so I would just pass for Tata Chemicals at this point of time. Okay. Uh, I wanted your thoughts on how to approach a stock like TVS Motor now, because, uh, you know, there is this announcement that has come through um, on, the, uh, on the issue of bonus preference shares. They've also added, uh, you know, two new independent directors on the board. There's Vijay Shankar as well as Shailesh Haribhakti. Uh, this stock has done exceptionally well, Dipan. It's doubled in the last one year. Do you see more upsides here? First of all, Sonia, we and our clients are invested in TVS Motor and I would say that's one of the best two-wheeler companies. And even in terms of returns and profitability, even better than our favorite Aisha Motors. Uh, but, uh, you know, valuations, every time you look at a good business, you look at the valuations and you feel, you no, know, at these prices, if I buy a TVS Motor or a stock trading at 40, 50 P multiple, am I going to get a good return going forward? Sure, earnings are good, but they do not justify this kind of a P multiple. TVS Motor per se is a very well-managed company, aggressive when it comes to new product launches, and perhaps the only two-wheeler company which is present in all these segments of the two-wheeler space, and they have a decent export footprint as well, and EV strategy also is pretty decent, so it checks many of the boxes except the valuation box, so these are great stocks to buy when there's a correction, if it falls by 15, 20, 25% from its peak for whatever reason, maybe overall uh, you know, market correcting, then that's a good entry point. But on a rising market like this, where the stock has moved up as much as it has, I don't think you will make great returns from this point over the medium to long term. All right, uh, <clears throat> uh, Deepan, uh, you know, we'll just have a, uh, take a quick commercial break here. Uh, we'll come back uh, with news, of course, that uh, there's nine minutes to go for the pre-open session. Actually, Chandan is with us, derivative and technical analyst uh, with Mothira Oswal Financial Services. Chandan Tapari. Chandan, hi, good morning. Good to have you with us here. I mean, the question is, uh, the markets uh, have been selling off at high levels. Yesterday was an incredibly volatile day. Uh, although, uh, you know, <clears throat> there have been a, a little directionless, right? Neither here nor there. Do you think we find a firm direction on the upside now and be able to hold on to the opening gains? Good morning, Prasant, Sonia. Thanks for having me. So we witnessed some profit booking from higher levels. Nifty corrected by around 800 points from the top of 22,526 to recent bottom of 21,17. On last trading session, we formed a, a reversal sort of candle, uh, dozy with long lower shadow, which you think at some sort of recovery could be there from lower levels. Good part is that global markets are supporting and recovery is also visible there. So because of that, we might see the 50% retracement and test of a key level. So because of the recent price formation and the profit booking decline, some sort of recovery will be there in the market. And because of that, expecting a swing to us, 22, 122 marks. So I believe some sort of stability will be baked. However, upside is going to be kept because of the cold writing activities, because of the absence of buying interest at higher zone. But with latest support, we believe some recovery could be there in the Nifty Index. Now talking about Bank Nifty Index, we witnessed a selling pressure for ninth consecutive trading session. It corrected by more than 2300 points, but now taking support at 50 DEMA and also respecting this rising trend line. So because of that, a bounce could be there to us, E zone of 47,000. So looking for some recovery in Nifty and Bank Nifty, and then it may consolidate at higher zone. Now looking at the stock wise, and we believe that again, a stock specific move will be there. We have to be very selective in the market scenario where volatility is lower, but swings are comparatively more in the market. So first that is buy on Maruti. We have selectively positive on the Nifty Auto and selective auto stocks are doing well. And here we are recommending to go long on Maruti, one of the strongest counter in the auto segment, given a consolidation breakout. We have seen built up of long position, which indicates fresh leg of rally. So recommending to buy with support of 11,700 and Maruti has potential to rally to us 12,500 zone. 
looking at the second idea that is buy on Cummins. Uh, we have seen positive price setup, technically set for a bull and flag breakout. Uh, expecting better rollover with higher roll costs, indicating momentum could continue for the week and next uh, week onwards. So one can buy Cummins with support of 27.30. And here we are expecting a run up to us 28.40 level. Last trading idea that is buy on SBI. Uh, the stock uh, witnessed profit booking in last eight trading session. It uh, formed the lower top, lower bottom, it, but it, it has negated the same. And we are expecting some follow up. So short covering trigger could be there led by put writing. So expecting SBI to bounce to us 6, 7, 760, 765. So one can buy with support of 722 zone. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, we'll take a break. Thanks a lot, Chandan, for that. Uh, that's Motilal Oswal Financial Services with their view on the market. Take a quick break. Come back with the pre-opening rates. Also, we will talk about uh, the auto sector. There's so much happening here in the electric vehicle space with auto ancillaries. Ashwin Patel of LKP Securities will put focus on the auto ancillary sector. They have released a detailed report on this. So we'll talk about that report in a bit. Copa. Welcome back. We have about 15 minutes left for the markets to open for the day. It looks like it's going to be a good opening. While delivering the keynote address at the Rising Bharat Summit, Prime Minister Narendra Modi promised to make the next five years a period of unprecedented growth and prosperity. He also declared that his government is already working on a blueprint for its third term and also preparing a roadmap for the next 25 years. Listen in. I'm ugly, but he's roadmap. और अपने तीसरे टर्म के पहले 100 दिन का प्लान भी बना रहे हैं सिर्फ 10 साल में 25 करोड़ लोगों का गरीबी से बाहर निकलना क्या ये ऐसे ही हो गया होगा क्या सिर्फ 10 साल में भारत का 11वें नंबर से पांचवे नंबर की इकोनॉमी बन जाना क्या ऐसे ही हुआ होगा क्या नियत सही तो काम सही और नियत कौन सी नेशन फर्स्ट की नियत आज भारत वो पैसेंजर बन चुका है जिसके बिना ग्लोबल फ्लाइट उड़ान भरने की सोच भी नहीं सकती अगले पांच साल में भारत वो पायलट बनेगा जो ग्लोबल फ्लाइट को नई बुलंदी के तरफ से ले जाएगा अगले पांच साल अनप्रेसिडेंटेड ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन के होंगे अगले पांच साल अनप्रेसिडेंटेड ग्रोथ के होंगे अगले पांच साल अनप्रेसिडेंटेड एक्सपांशन के होंगे अगले पांच साल अनप्रेसिडेंटेड प्रॉस्पेरिटी के होंगे और ये और ये मोदी की गारंटी है। Well, India is on a firm footing, and the next few years looks very, very good. Reiterating that stance coming in from our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi. Well, uh, let's get in Vamakshi though and focus back on the markets. She's here to tell us about uh, the stock that she's featuring in our momentumizer segment. Hi, Vamakshi. Well, good morning, Nigel. Uh, we will be focusing on CG Power. Now, keep in mind that the stock was up over 5.5% yesterday. And in fact, with that, the stock hit a fresh record high. In fact, in the last one month, the stock has surged by almost 15%. The surge that we uh, saw yesterday was backed by very strong volumes. Volumes were uh, at almost 3.2 times the 10-day average volume. And in fact, the value of shares traded on NSC was at 843 crores yesterday, which is the highest level that the company has seen since March 1st and this March 1st date is very important because that is when the company actually reacted to the announcement uh, that came through for uh, the semiconductor foray. Now the recent trigger is definitely the semiconductor foray. The company has announced a partnership with Renaissance and Star Microelectronics and will be setting up a semiconductor ATMP unit for specialized chip at a total investment of almost 7600 odd crores and in fact in the past in an interview with CNBC TV 18 the company has said that the domestic demand for semiconductors is expected to grow at almost 10 to 15% per annum and not only that they have also highlighted that the returns will 
could be attractive for the semiconductor foray. So given that, keep an eye out on CG Power. Okay, thanks a lot for that. So CG Power, uh, 10 to 15% growth in the semiconductor demand. In fact, Dipan is still with us. Dipan, this is a stock that has been hitting fresh 52-week highs. At this price, is the risk-reward still favourable? No, so I don't think so. I think end of the day, it's an industrial company and it's subject to cycles. Uh, right now, of course, we are seeing a fantastic upcycle in CAPEX and that's really benefiting CG Power. And I would say it's one of the best turnaround stories uh, of uh, India. I would rate it as that. But a lot of the positives have been priced in. And I know that semiconductor uh, foray has created some amount of excitement, but these are really long-term plans. And there's uh, they are fought with risk as well, technology, execution, and uh, overall, it could result in lowering of the return on capital ratios as well. So from that point of view, and looking at the valuations, I just like to not at least make a fresh investment in CG Power, but existing investors, I think it's an easy choice to remain invested. There is a lot of momentum behind the stock, and certainly it could rally further from these levels. But risk return profile wise, I wouldn't advise buying into it. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dipan, for that. Well, for now, the market in pre-opening is settling much higher. So just look at that, the Nifty uh, clawing back to that 22,000 mark, up about 160 about points. A lot of stocks in focus, Wipro, SBI, ICICI Bank, Tata Steel, all your top gainers at the moment in pre-opening. And uh, there are plenty of names that are in the news, so let's uh, put the spotlight on that. Uh, the auto ancillary space has been very interesting. LKP Securities is positive on a whole host of auto ancillary stocks. They've put out an exhaustive report with names like Craftsman Auto, Endurance Tech, Sona, BLW topping their list. But there's also so much happening in the EV space. So let's talk about that. Ashwin Patil, who is the author of that report, joins in now. He's a senior research analyst at LKP Securities. Ashwin, uh, hi, good morning. Before I talk to you about that report, I also want to understand your view on TVS Motor. They've announced this bonus preference share uh, of four non-convertible redeemable preference shares for every one equity share held. So certainly this is positive for shareholders, you know, given the additional payout, it's like a large one-time dividend that they're giving. But it seems a bit unwarranted at this point in time, given that the company has large capex plans, they have big debt on their books as well. Um, don't you think this would, uh, you know, not go down too well with the street? Just your basic understanding of TVS Motor. I think TVS Motors has been one of the best performers on volume terms, uh, you know, over the past uh, few years. Uh, they have beaten uh, Bajaj Auto and uh, Hero Motor Corp as far as their volumes are concerned. But when we go down to their profitability, they have recently just, you know, surpassed the 10% mark on the margins front, on the operating, operating margins front. And they had been promising that since a long time, but just, you know, they are creeping and crawling slightly. Uh, to achieve that uh, uh, because, uh, you know, their uh, 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 their costs are slightly higher than, uh, uh, especially on the marketing side, are higher than that of Bajaj Auto and Hero Motor Corp. And they have to, you know, still they are having uh, 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 the third, number three position in the two-wheeler space. So, uh, you know, uh, I am not really very positive on TPS Motors from uh, since a long time, but the stock has moved up. The valuations are also not really very supportive. Uh, the market is cheering the volumes, but I am really, you know, slightly on the skeptical side. So this preference share uh, issue with a lot of capex, uh, as you said, on the background with the debt also, you know, may uh, not attract that many investors. I think so. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, the market uh, is definitely, you know, the best judge of uh, whatever ha is happening in, uh, you know, any particular stock. So I think that uh, TVS Motors, you know, uh, it should correct a bit from these levels uh, uh, because the valuations are not at all supportive as compared to uh, the likes. I mean, always it has been like that, that the valuations are quite too high at premium uh, without the uh, the financial performance uh, that uh, that is expected and that should go or gel with this kind of valuations. Correct, correct. Take your point entirely. So you are a bit sceptical on TVS Motor. One, it seems a bit unwarranted that they've come out with this uh, preference issue given that they have high capex and debt. And two, the stock has run up a lot. Got that. Now, the other big development that took place in the auto space is the government announcing this e-vehicle policy, right? They are trying to promote India as a manufacturing destination of electric vehicles. Tesla could be coming in very soon, setting up their manufacturing unit here. What does this mean for the auto ancillary space that you track very closely? Which are the companies that could be big beneficiaries of the government opening up India as a manufacturing hub for EVs? See, uh, this EV pro proliferation that has been happening in the domestic markets is definitely positive for 
a lot many auto ancillaries uh, you know especially you know those who are catering uh, uh, those who are ev agnostic i mean uh, ma many of them are you know uh, catering to ic as well as the ev segment and uh, you know this is an ev uh, th those companies which are uh, you know like sona blw i would say that uh, they are one of the uh, you know preferenced pre uh, preferred stock i would say within the uh, auto ancillary space because out of their total order book of about 240 billion uh, rupees about 78% is uh, you know uh, it will be going to the ev manufacturers and tesla is like uh, their number two uh, client uh, and they entering into India and the manufacturing of uh, semiconductors, the laying of plants. Yesterday also we saw that the JV between uh, MG Hector and JSW and the plants that they have laid is going to be a big thing in India and companies like uh, Sona BLW, then uh, there is Sansera Engineering, which also will be benefited out of that. There are several companies within the space of auto, uh, you know, uh, ancillaries, which would be uh, looking to uh, benefit out of this because uh, they are, you know, they can have the best of both the worlds, like the IC as well as the EVs. Uh, so whichever proliferates, they will be having the best uh, advantage of that. Okay, all right, Ashwin. Hi, uh, good morning, Prashant here. You know, let's talk about some of your picks in that note that you put out as well. And Craftsman Auto uh, catches one's attention. You know, it's uh, from the highs, it's come off. The high was about 5,400. It's about 3,800 3, now. Uh, but it's, it's been one of those outstanding performers, right, since listing. A slow kind of start, but then really took off. Uh, what's the thesis here? And uh, I think you're putting out a price target of about 6,100 or so on this one. Uh, so... Uh, just, just uh, your thoughts on Craftsman, yes. Yeah, uh, see, Craftsman Automation, we have been like a bullish, uh, uh, I mean, quite bullish on the stock since its uh, IPO when it came uh, in 2021. So, you know, since then, uh, we have been the first to come out with a report on Craftsman Automation, the IC. And, uh, uh, you know, since 1800 uh, levels, we have been tracking it and it has been a fantastic performer since then. Uh, so, you know, you know, I mean, uh, they are catering to the commercial vehicle sector, they are catering to the EVs, then they are uh, having a presence in the non-auto, the industrial segment as well. And all the three businesses have been performing well. Uh, they have recently done the acquisition of DR Axion, which is a Korean company and catering to likes of m and and Hyundai Kia. And uh, they have been, uh, you know, uh, supplying... Uh, 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 their uh, uh, their products to these uh, companies, which are definitely doing fantastically well, because MNM we know that they are the number one uh, player on the uh, uh, SUV side on the volume front, and uh, uh, Hyundai Kia is also quite a strong player in India. So and uh, DR Axion is having, also having strong margins, close to about 18 to 19 percent. That is, you know, uh, uh, completely lifting up the margins of their aluminium business product. So yeah, they have got a wide, you know, range of products. Though they are catering to the uh, the passenger, the the commercial vehicle segment, uh, you know, there's that the, that dependence has gone down significantly, and therefore, you know, we, uh, with the uh, strong margins, close to about 20, 22 percent that the entire business is having at this point in time, we are quite bullish on this stock. At 1350, again, we have slightly we have slightly cut down the target because the you know the uh, the 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 stock has come down a bit, and now our target stands close to about 5100. But uh, definitely, I mean, the cut is not uh, uh, because any fundamental reasons, but uh, because of the valuations, uh, uh, you know, and the stock uh, moving down slightly. Therefore, we still maintain a strong buy on the stock. Uh, that has been the top pick uh, in our uh, portfolio. All right, Ashwin. A final question before we let you go. Then, on tire stocks, are negative, right? It's because of the big spike we've seen seen in the raw material. That's natural rubber. Exactly. See that uh, the natural rubber prices have moved significantly, and uh, most of the tire stocks are, you know, in a capex mode. They are, you know, coming up with lot of capex everywhere. Their margins are going to get hit because of the uh, the natural rubber prices which have gone up. Even there is some sort of, uh, uh, you know, instability on the crude side. The dependence on crude is also going to take a toll, uh, you know, on their uh, overall uh, margin performance. So we have, uh, you know, we are not really very uh, bullish on the tyre space. All right, not very bullish on the tyre space. Got it. Uh, lots more to chat, but we have, uh, you know, we'll take this to another day. Thanks, Ashwin, for joining in and giving us your thoughts. We have the market opening on our hand and plenty of stocks to talk about. Sudarshan Sukhani is joining in. Sudarshan, what's the big call at 9.10?
Well, consider buying Bajaj Finance with a stop under 63.67. And Mitesh, what about you? I'll go with a buy on RBL Bank for targets of 244, 244. Okay, some very interesting reports coming in on Motilal Oswal and on BSC. Uh, and, you know, initiate coverage as well as an upgrade coming through. So, if you want to get the latest on that, Sudarshan is here to tell us more about it, Sudarshan. So, we have two market-related stocks. First one is Investec on BSE. It has upgraded the stock to buy from hold and target is pitched 2800 per share. It says, company continues to witness strong traction in equity derivatives volumes and option market share jumped three times sequentially from 4.2% to 15% plus in March 2024 and it anticipates further market share gains given rapid scale-up of BankX product and expects an improved margin profile in Q4 FY24. Next is MK on Motilal Oswal Finance. It initiated coverage with buy rating and target is pitched 2,000 per share. It says company is a per perfect vehicle to ride India's wealth and asset and wealth management are well propped to deliver superior growth and FY23-26 operating profit CAGR seen at 25% and also 70% of its network net worth is in equity and MF treasury assets which is an added safety margin to valuations and core business. All right, I mean actually, uh, yeah, Motilal is Perhaps if you look at uh, broking companies, but Motilal, of course, also has an asset management business there, uh, which uh, it, it, it would rate as one of the cheaper uh, sort of broking companies if you want to look at, uh, if you want to use that tag as compared to Angel, etc. as well. So uh, that's interesting calls coming in. So thanks very much for that. But Walk Hard is the next one we want to focus on. Vivek is here with details. Vivek. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, so, you know, earlier we told you about how the company is looking to uh, raise funds via the QIP route. Uh, we didn't know the quantum, but, uh, you know, over the last time, uh, what we managed to do is we managed to access the term sheet uh, for this particular fundraise. Uh, so, the total issue size and the total funds that Vocard is looking to garner is over 570 crore. The base size is 350 crore and the green shoe option is up to 220 crore should the company choose to exercise the green shoe option. The indicative issue price is at almost a 5% discount at 517 rupees a share. And at that particular rate, assuming that the full, the complete 570 crore is what the company is looking to raise, the equity dilution at the current market price would be 7.11%. Uh, uh, the SEBI floor price, like we mentioned earlier, is 544. So it'll be interesting to see what is the kind of interest that Vocard gets uh, from, you know, from institutional equities for this particular fundraise. All right, uh, Vivek, uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, just counting down the next minute or so for the market uh, open which should be with us. The Nifty is indicating a 150-point higher start, uh, and you've got the Sensex, which is indicating a 400-point higher start. Maybe we can just quickly uh, run through the Nifty Bank uh, and the broader indices as well. Uh, Bank Nifty has been falling for nine sessions in a row, and uh, the open this morning is encouraging. Three quarters of a percent higher at about 363. Uh, and the mid and small cap indices, right? Uh, they absolutely flat closed. You wouldn't know whether anything happened in the market was even trading yesterday. Mm -hmm. But 1% higher in the small cap index, and I think you've got the mid cap index, which starts about 1% uh, up as well. So the important thing today, of course, is sustenance of the gains through the course of the day by the time we wrap up things. Uh, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll see if that happens. In terms of large news-related stocks, there isn't very much uh, in that sense, at least nothing very big. Uh, but that's not stopped uh, sort of, you know, moves in individual sectors and st uh, stocks uh, which have been in a focus. So just sort of counting down the next uh, minute or so uh, to the market open. Right. Okay, a minute to the market open. Just want to point out a couple of more stocks, right? RVNL has emerged as the lowest bidder for an electric traction system project. And these stocks have been so much in focus. Mm. RVNL, for example, is up 40% this year already in the first mm. three months. So pretty strong there. But yes, we'll get to talking about individual stocks in a bit. For now, I think there's a, uh, you know, wave of relief for the bulls at least. That today, the start will be positive. Let's see how it goes from there. Absolutely. And uh, the first ticks coming up straight up uh, on your screens now. So 22,000 plus on the Nifty. Uh, that's good. 22,008 or so is where the Nifty is starting at. The Sensex is uh, starting at 72,660 or so. Uh, so these are decent uh, starting levels. I mean, in line with what the Gift Nifty, etc. were indicating earlier in the day. Bank Nifty is starting about 0 0.8 higher. That's a 400 point pop. 46,710 is where the Nifty Bank is at. Mid cap index starts at about 46,500, uh, and which is about 1% higher. And I think a similar kind of start on the small cap index as well. 
with a 1.5% pop. But stocks now and uh, more rates, Sonia is standing by. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. So, you know, straight to individual stocks now. You have TVS Motor, where uh, the company has an approved that issue of bonus preference shares. Uh, so, TVS Motor is up almost about 1.5%. The street is taking it very well. Apart from that, you have uh, Walkhard, which will be launching a QIP to raise funds. So, Walkhard has been in the news. 3.5% higher on that stock. Volumes are also picking up on Walkhard. RBNL, as I mentioned a while back, has emerged as the low lowest bidder for an electric traction system project. RBNL now up almost about 3.5%. A lot of interesting brokerage reports this morning. I want to take it to Avenue Supermarkets. 2% higher. CLSA has initiated a buy with a target price of 5,107. Big upside to the current market price. They talk about a huge potential and the market is, uh, you know, still um, still quite unorganized. Let's go to Motilal Oswal Financial where MK has initiated a buy with a target price of 2,000 rupees on the stock. 2.5% higher on Motilal Oswal. BSC, Investec has upgraded BSC to a buy from a hold. They have a target price of 2,800 rupees on the stock. So that stock is up 4%. Uh, charging ahead this morning. Then you have Prince Pipe. The company will be acquiring a bathware brand called Aquil uh, for, and they'll acquire the plant as well, which is located uh, in Gujarat for 55 crores. So Prince Pipes is up almost about 1.5%. All in all, you'd have to say a great start to trade. 166 points higher, hanging on to 22,000. Here you have the big leadership from the for the market this morning coming in from banks up 400 points. But the most important part is whether this is something that is sustainable, right? Because this is a market that has been a sell-on rally for a while. Let's see if this level holds. Back to you. All right. Well, the banking uh, stocks, they're doing well. And the Nifty Bank has opened up and it's crossed the 50 DMA. So one hurdle's out of the way, the 46,450-odd mark. Now, all eyes on the 20 DMA, which comes in at around 46,933 odd. And when, uh, you know, the Fed sounds more dovish than hawkish, then you have two sectors that do well. One is the Nifty IT index, so that's opened up well in the green. And the second one is the Metal index as well. That one as well has bounced back in today's trading session. In NNBC, we had City that was sounding fairly cautious out there. You know, there were some reports that indicated overnight that NNBC could have trimmed down on their prices and that was more or less anticipated because we had global iron ore prices that corrected from around $130 per ton to around $105 per ton. We'll try to get you the exact quantum but for the time being that stock as well has opened up well in the green. In terms of stocks that are moving around today, well top volume movers you have uh, Ujjivan that's up close to 4.5%, you have Sale as well that's popped up close to around 4% and PFC. Keep in mind some of these stocks have seen a fair bit of correction from the top. Zomato is uh, bucking the trend. In fact, yesterday it ended at the high point of the day. Today as well, that's opened up with a gain of around 2.5%. And BHEL, well, that's another stock that's done quite well. So it's a good start. The Nifty has opened above the 22,000 odd mark. The Nifty Bank has taken out the 50 DMA. Can both these two key indices get to the 20 DMA? That's going to be the key trigger from the bullish perspective. Prashant? Uh, well, uh, you know, so good start, right? 170 points on the Nifty, 22,000 plus mm -hmm. is where we are at. Just a few other names. Uh, Bharat Dynamics is up uh, starting about 2.6% 2, 2 in the green. Uh, stock, that's BDL, that's about 16.65 or so. Uh, PFC, RVNL, I mean, actually, there's a lot of PSUs, right? Sale, BHL, RVNL, PFC, uh, Nalco, BDL, Bank of India, Hutco. These are all, I mean, actually, the top... Uh, seven, eight volume-led gainers are all public sector uh, stocks. Uh, a variety of different sectors, but uh, they're all PSU names here. JSW Infra is another one which is starting about 3, 3.5% three higher. Rico Auto has done phenomenally well uh, in, the, in the recent past, last six months. 6% on Rico Auto is coming up with volumes. Uh, so we are highlighting that. Motilal Uswal, Sud was talking about that, but volumes are decent. Price is nothing. I mean, it's starting about a half a percent higher. Rate gain uh, had a, a had a uh, order win, I think, in the morning. We put that out. Two and a half percent higher on rate gain. Uh, but that's about it. So I think we'll give it, a, uh, you know, a minute, two minutes more, and then we'll uh, come back to it. Market breadth is uh, very, very strong. Ten is to one. Ten is to one in favor of advances. But these are just starting kind of values. Praj is down 1% as the largest volume-led uh, pullback, which is 1% after yesterday's 10% rally uh, that we had. Uh, Britannia and Nestle are down uh, half a percent and 0.6%. Uh, again, on the downside, nothing in terms of volumes. Rainbow saw Rainbow Hospitals, that saw a big 7-8% move yesterday. That's down about 1%. So, uh, G, uh, GPT Health was another big mover yesterday. That's down about one and a quarter percent or so. Uh, so, you know, a little bit here and there, but... Uh, volumes are yet to pick up, especially on stocks which are 
on the downside. Sonia. You know, I just want to mention, uh, Motila yeah. Loswal put out a report on Reliance mm -hmm. where they have reiterated their buy rating on the stock with a target price of 3200 mm -hmm. They speak about how the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy recently announces its, its plans to set up two hydrogen hubs in India by FY26. They are providing incentives to set up those hydrogen hubs as well. And both these announcements are key milestones towards the government's vision to develop a strong green hydrogen ecosystem. So they believe that this could sort of aid Reliance further. So Reliance is one stock. The other stock that they like is uh, Gland Pharma where they have a 32% upside on Gland Pharma, Motilal Oswal. They have a buy and they say that valuations are very attractive at the moment. All right. Uh, <clears throat> interesting names there, Sonia. We'll uh, tr attract them. Markets, of course, still holding with a 160-odd point higher start. Uh, Amit Sajdeva is with us. He's head of uh, India Equity Strategy at HSBC. Amit, uh, good to have you back in the program. It's been a while. Thanks very much for your time. Prashant, this side. Uh, I mean, you, you know, your view seems to be that... Uh, Maybe a little bit of consolidation, but nothing large in terms of a pullback. Uh, this is not 2018, I think, as you put it. Uh, just explain that view, and uh, but but you're still kind of leaning more towards large caps. So just kind of put that in context for us. Yeah, thanks, Prashant. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. See, I think the main point is that uh, we have to go back and analyze India's own cycles. There's a lot of wisdom buried there. So let me bring out very crisp one on mid cap and small caps. First of all, mid caps and small caps are uh, symptoms of India's bull runs. A momentum once set doesn't go, the, go away that easily. And what happens is that typically that run over market run is about 1.4x. We have been flagging for a while that that run was already around 2x, which means that there was a lot of fraud in mid and small caps. And if you look at last four years, uh, they have been a consistent outperformance. There is a, and if you go back to the history, you realize when that happens, you are going towards a year where there will be negative or muted returns, right? Now, <clears throat> when the last month's sell-off has happened in small and mid caps, it triggers an alarm. And what that alarm is, are we looking for much deeper curves? Because small caps corrected 8% and mid caps corrected 4% and momentum uh, seems precarious when you ignore a day such as today, for example, right? And, and if you look at uh, um, that uh, momentum, it triggers uh, and a question as well whether we are looking at 2008 cycle where mid caps and small caps corrected 30%. So question is, are we in that cycle? My short answer to that is no. We are not looking at 20 to 30% aggregate correction because the context is very, very favorable and very different from 2018. But does that mean mid caps and small cap will do well from here? Uh, my answer is also we need to be very cautious. Uh, the returns could be an aggregate level, would be at the best lackluster or muted. But having said that, market would be in you know, an intermittent risk on and risk off. Corrections will also present buying opportunities and mid caps. So we must exploit that as well. But on aggregate basis, my my tilt would be towards larger caps have lagged last year. Earning look, growth looks good. Indian market context seems very good overall. So we see an overall positive context. But tilting towards the larger cap, but mid caps and small caps would have its own share of volatility. Let's to summarize that bit here. Okay, so mid caps and small caps will continue to have its own share of volatility. Got it. Um, Amit, thanks a lot for joining in. So, you know, how do you approach the markets now? For, I mean, you, you've told us about the backdrop. But from here on, what's the best way to approach the markets? Do you raise your cash levels? Do you churn out of mid and small caps and into large caps? Do you move to other asset classes? Over the next 12 months, what's the advice? Okay, now that's a great question, Sonia. Let me just break it down into two parts. Okay. First of all, we need to have a view uh, how risk tolerate the market will be. Right? And second, uh, how the earnings and things will shape up, etc. So my, my uh, sense is that uh, if the U.S. bond yields are seen to be correcting, because the key factor for India is also would be external, not just internal, right? So if U.S. bond yields, which are expected to be corrected and expected to be you know, coming down, if it is going in the right trajectory, I see a return of a big risk on in India. If risk on happens, you could expect major bounces in corrected names as well, which includes mid and small caps as well. But even uh, with the moderate expectations there, my sense is that earning outlook for India is good. So there'll be at least a decent year, if not a big risk on it. That's one. Now, within that context, we divide sectors into three larger 
you know buckets right one bucket is where things have already looking very uh, precarious from uh, investor sentiment point of view and business dynamics also negative we call it a risk on bucket right so uh, that bucket outperforms a lot when market is willing to take risk with a two year view that could happen but only so so one must choose some ideas from there and and in our last report we we highlighted that banks have slipped into that basket a little bit so there are some interesting sectors are parking there right but at the same time we also must look at momentum some earning outlooks are very good and also the stock returns are very good but momentum can carry on this market as well so we need to blend momentum as well and then there are some sectors which are very well positioned from a long and short term point of view as well so we need to take a bubble kind of approach and blend all these three things together uh, to navigate this year i don't know whether that answer precisely question because i can't talk, talk specific here but uh, i can sort of give more guidance on sector as such but uh, our view is that it is we should expect uh, bouts of consolidations and bouts of uh, you know strong rebounds in this year as the earnings shape up whether any downgrade risk are building up etc but on an average i expect uh, a decent 2024 it is not going to be a negative year all right uh, hi amit good morning and you know good to hear your thoughts uh, you know for one our retail audience will be breathing a sigh of relief that you're saying 2024 is very different from 2018 because that was a very very painful period for the broader markets and this time around you believe things are different since you want to talk a lot uh, about sectors let's talk about the paints industry you know you have a new player that's come in there and there's a probability of some disruption as to its pricing they have positioned it lower and they're giving more volumes as well out to the dealers but one of the top ideas that you'll have is asian paints you know as a consumer maybe i still tilt towards the asian paints just maybe but from a stock perspective given that there is going to be some enhanced competition how do you approach the space uh you know for for uh, right or wrong purpose we can't discuss individual stocks here so you have to excuse me there but i can broadly say that uh, what our view has been that uh uh price was sustainable price was are unlikely there's a little less space there in the space but i think uh, it's more around how uh, you know um, how the conduct shape us our view is that it's likely to be rational the reason for putting that is market is obviously bearish stocks have corrected on these concerns but largely we believe that rationality will prevail uh, sooner and then market will discount that that's the reason for uh, taking contrarian view in that space there but i'll leave it at that we we can't discuss Uh, very specific context here. But then, but let me let me just give you some perspective on 2018, right? Because what mm-hmm. should give you confidence that we are not 2018? Right? Number one, 2018 saw a broader market sell off of seven percent. That was a very bad. And then we have island affairs crisis unfolding that year. We had GDP growth which was 3.9. We had a US tightening cycle happening. and we had also earning downgrade earning expectation that year was 22 fell down to as the year ended was like single digits so whatever could go wrong in that year was going wrong and then mid cap and small cap which had had a massive run of four years uh, corrected 20 to 30% 27% mid caps and 30% small cap but contrast to 2018 we are in a much stronger year macro is strong earning outlook is very good not unrealistically high we are looking at a us softening cycle not tightening cycle we don't have any major you know crisis in the making as such which we saw that year perhaps and valuations have corrected a little bit so i would say uh, some breather from there so we are not looking at that precarious a year but given the valuation given the incessant run that has happened last year we also must build in some caution we cannot sort of just take a view yeah. that okay you know we have to build caution we have to not pay for excessive cash we have to avoid paying for excessive valuation or with a lot of hope trade is happening so one balance yeah. one must balance that view i would leave that don't worry about i would not worry about 2018 like you know situation prevailing but also caution yes, that uh, buying rationality is key this year because we should not forget uh, china has performed a lot right we, yeah, we are looking yeah. at years of performance we need to balance Got those it. risks I mean- Yeah. Take that point. No, absolutely. Take that point. By the way, I just want to highlight uh, these names, right? Look at CG Power. CG Power was also our momentumizer uh, name this morning. Seven percent uh, on uh, CG Power, uh, and uh, this after CG Power was uh, went up about five percent yesterday, right? So that's the uh, uh, CG Power now is the largest volume led gainer across the board. 
I mean, if you flip that and look at the volumes compared to the average, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, the other two, the other the number two, number three big volume-led gainers are PFC and REC, each of which is up uh, four, four and a half percent. So this is, I mean, these names, PFC, RE, uh, REC, are kind of reminiscent of, uh, you know, just strong momentum, uh, if not uh, many other things as well. So just one aspect of it. Triveni turbines moved up sharply yesterday. That's following up with the sharp gain, about six and a half percent there, uh, and something like a, a Sterling Wilson Solar. 5%, uh, so that's also corrected quite a bit, 491 on uh, that uh, name coming through. Action Construction Equipment, Gensol, uh, these are all kind of coming up. Inox, Win, names which were not there at the open. And of course, something like a Graphite India and HEG are two other names which are up 5% each uh, this morning. So, you know, broader market uh, doing uh, sort of very well and kind of broadening out really in that sense. Amit, uh, just your view on... Uh, you know, these new business opportunities, right? Uh, so, for example, I know you can't talk about specific stocks, but CG Power making a foray and in investing into this semiconductor uh, conductor chip packaging segment. Uh, sure. One of the uh, sort of big players who've announced investments, and I guess many others others will follow. Uh, just, just your thoughts, and which are the areas, these new segments that you're bullish on, where you think there is an opportunity to make money as minority shareholders? So, look, you know, what happens is that, you know, uh, there are two views. Prashant is the right question, and one can obviously can't tell specific into anything. So what, what I can simply say is that what does it tell you? When you look at these names, it tells you that market is willing to look at uh, decadal opportunities. Market is willing to uh, take risk on something which is longer-term themes, which is still emerging, may not have anything in the next two years, but market is willing to bet on what players could benefit from a larger trend. So that tells you that uh, when, when we are looking at India, India is being looked at as uh, not a tactical, but a large structural decadal run as well. You know, that, that signals that market is willing to tolerate some risk in the short run and be willing to place bets on longer term themes as well. So that gives you some amount of at least confidence that the structural uh, duration of India is, uh, is seen as a very long one. And that's the reason some themes that come and go and will play out like that. It's very difficult to take, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, thematic view every day on that. But what I would say is that, you know, anything that looks long term, where, where the business models are formidable, uh, market would place intermittently, uh, you know, long cycle view on those. That, I will leave it at that, to be honest. Okay. You know, I also wanted to talk about the consumption space, right? So I noticed in your buy ideas, you have Avenue Supermarts as one of the stocks. And this morning, in fact, Avenue Supermarts is at a fresh high. CLSA has spoken about how there is a $500 billion addressable market out of which only 5% of the market is organized. So, uh, do you see the scope here, despite the kind of, you know, um, steep valuations that some of these uh, co companies are sitting on? Sony, I'll just talk in general, because there's stock I sure, cover as sure. well. As I said, that we can't talk about stocks. What I would say is that why we have chosen such names is, is one, we believe there's a long-term opportunity. But stock is also corrected for one of the two reasons, and there could be many such stocks, right? And risk reward tends to become favorable. And one has to look at uh, such ideas in this market where things have bottomed out and market is willing to take risk for one year. Uh, so our view was that wherever earning outlook seems to be bottoming out and turning around, those ideas can work as well. I'm not specifically naming avenue, but all I'm trying to say in general, uh, that's a larger theme we have played there. A structurally winning business model, bottomed out, and could look at uptick in, for example, growth or margins or whatever, based on oh. certain theme that we have. Okay, all right. Uh, we will let you go on that note. Thank you for joining in and taking the time out uh, for us on the channel today. Well, that is the word coming in on the market, which, by the way, is looking very good. The Nifty is holding at 22,000. It hasn't been able to build on to its gains uh, substantially. But be that as it may, the gains are good for now. 160 points higher on the Nifty. The Sensex is up 500 points. The first corporate on our radar is SJVN. The stock has surged more than 286% in the last one year. What's going on here? We'll find out the power demand trends, the opportunities in the renewable energy space. Geeta Kapoor, the chairman and managing director at SJVN, joins us now to talk about that. Ms. Kapoor, thank you uh, so much for joining us. You know, I want to first start by asking you about the tariff trends, especially in the renewable energy space. Can you tell us um, what are the, for hydro projects particularly, if we start with that, right? Uh, what, what are the key upcoming projects that are eligible for higher returns? What do you make of the tariffs that have been proposed so far? Right. 
uh, if we talk of hydro, see, comparatively, because of the initial cost that is involved in hydro projects, the tariff is a little higher. Per unit, as on date, we can say it's approximately around 8 rupees, whereas as compared to solar, which ranges from 2.50 to 3 rupees. But this is the initial. With the passage of time, the tariff in hydro undergoes a big change. See, in the initial investment cost in hydro is more, but as per CERC norms, in a period of about 12 years, the original, once the repayment of loan is over, the tariff gets reduced because, see, tariff is determined in terms of five things. It's return on equity, it's interest on loan capital. So once the loan is repaid, interest reduces, we have depreciation, we have interest in working capital and the operation and maintenance expenses. For example, I would like to tell you that when NGHPS Army, our 1500 megawatt Nathpa Jakri hydro power station started commercial operation, the tariff was more than 4 rupees per unit. As on date, the tariff has reduced to 2 rupees 40 paisa. And it happens with all the hydro projects. As of today, a hydro power station that is Rampur, the tariff is mm. around 4 rupees, a little more than 4, 4 rupees 16 paisa. But after 12 years, this will reduce to 3 rupees. So what happens in hydro is starting tariff is higher because of the higher. initial investment cost. But with the passage of time, it reduces. Okay, that's, that's very helpful actually. So you said right now, it's 8 rupees per unit on an average, right? The hydro power Only tariff. Now. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I want to also understand what are the key projects that are eligible for higher returns? What are the upcoming projects that you have in the hydro space? Okay, in the hydro space specifically, if we talk of, we are uh, building a project uh, that is Arun 3 in Nepal. This is 900 megawatt and we propose to commission it by the end of your financial year 24-25, that is in February 25. It is 900 megawatt and uh, uh, which adds around 1200 crores to our revenue once it is commissioned. So this is one project which is coming up in the year 24-25. In the year 25-26, we propose to add another 276 megawatt, that is Luri Hydro Project. 210 and then we have Bhalasat 66 megawatt so in both the cases again you can say that we um, we have a good sum to add to our revenue more than 1000 crores so uh, on an average in the coming two years we will add a capacity of 900 plus 276 in hydro Okay, all right. Hi, Mr. Kapoor, Ms. Kapoor, and good morning. Thanks so much for joining. And so if you could just give us a brief idea, what is the current hydro capacity that you have? You know, you've told us, I think, Krishna, 1100 megawatt is what you're going to be adding in the next two years in hydro. What is the current hydro capacity? And how do you see it scaling up in the next few years? And also on the non-hydro side, what is the current capacity, Ms. Kapoor? And where do you see that number headed? Right. See, as on date, our total... Uh, commissioned projects capacity is 2,377. The major chunk goes to hydro. That is 1,972 megawatt, it's hydro. And we have 404 renewable projects as of today, right? Now, with the passage of time, we, uh, we propose to add, as far as hydro, has, I already told you, 900 megawatt in the coming year, 24-25. But in renewable sector, we propose to add around 2,000 megawatt in the coming year. One of our major projects, that is single location largest solar project, Bikaner project, 1,000 megawatt, we propose to commission uh, towards September end or October. So this adds 1,000 megawatt to our installed capacity, 900 on account of Arun 3, and several small projects. So a total of about 2,900 we will add in terms of megawatt, both hydro and solar, in the coming year, 24-25. Beyond that, we propose to add approximately 1,500 megawatt to 2,000 megawatt in renewable sector every year. And that we see up to 2030. And in hydro sector, 
I'm very happy to share that SJVN has started its work on the 3097 megawatt Italian project in the state of Arunachal Pradesh. SJVN is also working on Sunni Hydro project, which is 382 megawatt, and we propose to commission it, say, towards the beginning of the year 28 or 27 end. So, right. You know, Ms. Kapoor, you've given us a fair idea about the capacity addition and, you know, you have ambitious plans both on the hydro and more importantly on the renewable side of things as well. At some scale, the non-hydro part of the business, will you look at unlocking some value, maybe getting an investor, maybe, uh, you know, splitting both the two businesses? Uh, see, we, see, what we see for ourselves is we envision by the year 2030 an installed capacity of around 50, 15,000 in renewables, a good 8,000 in hydro and a small approximately 2,000 in thermal. So we all our uh, verticals, we are moving ahead in all our verticals at equal speed, especially hydro and renewables. And renewables, you see, it's in line with Government of India initiatives also. As per Government of India uh, vision, they it is planned that by the year 2030, we'll have 5 lakh uh, of solar. Mega, 5 so lakh megawatt of solar installed capacity. Mm. Sorry, okay. uh, sorry, I'm... You said 15,000 megawatt is the total renewable capacity, ma'am, right? By 2030 is the aim. 2030, which we propose to implement, we envision to implement. So that's mm -hmm. about five times from where, where you are right now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, uh, ma'am, could you, just a few points. How much of the capacity uh, that, uh, of the commission, uh, nearly 3,000 megawatt capacity uh, is, uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, the agreements are all long term power purchase agreements or and how much are you did you sell in the short term market as well uh, see in in many cases the agreements mm. are in place for example i mentioned to you my bikaner plant we have 1000 megawatt 500 mm. megawatt already stands committed to rajasthan urja vikas nigam and it services limited 300 stands committed to jkpcl that is jammu and kashmir power corporation limited and 200 stands committed to uh, upcl that is the state of uttarakhand so a lot of power projects especially the solar power projects which are coming in solar parks stand committed to the respective states for example uh, we will be we have about 900 megawatt capacity to be implemented uh, in uh, Khavra Solar Park, Gujarat. This we have got through Gujarat Urja Vikas Nikam Limited and okay. the capacity is committed. Yeah. Roughly, ma'am, I mean, so broadly, what, what were, as of now, how much is long-term power purchase and how much is uh, untied capacity? And, uh, and if you can tell us, if you get to this, I mean, what's the broad aim? You'd like to have some free capacity as well, right? Uh, right. Untied capacity as well. Yeah. See, our effort is to sign long-term PPAs. Generally, a PPA is for 25 years. Wherever we have committed, generally the PPA is for 25 years. Uh, first effort is always that we get uh, a commitment for our power sale. And But there are times when we do sale in the um, exchange also. For example, as on date, our Nidwar Mori project, 60 megawatt, the energy is being, uh, being sold through the exchange. So hmm. they're both side by side. But first effort is to get into a long term sign, uh, for 25 yeah. years. Okay. Uh, what kind of earnings growth can we expect, ma'am? I mean, on a steady state basis, you've got very steady uh, capacity expansion plans over the next many years, uh, and you've laid out uh, some of that vision. Uh, but in terms of earnings growth, what should investors expect on a compounded basis for the next few years? Um, as of today, exactly, I think for the year 24-25, I can mm -hmm. tell you that we'll be adding around 2,700 crores mm -hmm. in our revenue. 
with the present projects in hand, uh, another 1,000 to 1,500 crore we will add in the year 25, 26. And uh, so you can say around this, we'll be adding every year. Because if we are talking of implementing 2,000 megawatt in renewables and mm. the tariff ranges from 250 to 3 rupees, so every year we end up add, add, adding 2,000, 2,500 crores to our revenue okay. stream. Okay. Ms. Kapoor, just before we let you go, I just wanted an update very quickly on this Arun 2 and the Buxar project. Are they on track to be commissioned in February 2025 and September 2024? Uh, any commissioning delays that we should expect there? Um, as far as Arun, it is Arun 3 basically. Uh, okay. Arun 3 we propose to commission by February 2024. Five, as I had already shared, even in Baxil, we are we are on schedule, and um, hopefully uh, the first light, lighting of the boiler will go to September uh, twenty four this year. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll let you go on that note. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure listening to you, and so much to learn as well about the sector as well as your company. So hopefully, we'll get to speak to you again very soon. Uh, that's SJVN, one of the strongest stocks in the last one year. And, uh, you know, that's uh, Geeta Kapoor talking about the demand trends in this space. But let's slip into a break. On the other side, we have a very interesting company, Prince Pipes. Nihar Cheda will be joining in to talk about their acquisition of the bathware brand Aquel. Stay tuned for that. Co-presented. Welcome back. Well, let's uh, focus on Prince Pipes and Fittings. That's the next management on the show. The company acquired Gujarat-based Aquil brand for around 55 crore rupees. The company is also setting up an in-house manufacturing facility and it's looking to expand its bathware presence. Well, to discuss this acquisition and the way ahead, we're joined by Mr. Nira, Nihar Chedda, the Vice President, Corporate Strategy at Prince uh, Pipes. Uh, hi, Nihar. Good morning and good to see you in. Give us a few details of this. You're going to be spending closer to around 55 crore rupees. Could you tell us the acquired unit? What kind of utilization levels is it at? I understand it's not too high. And at optimum levels, what kind of revenue can you generate from this acquired unit? Sure. Yeah. Morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so we have signed an asset purchase agreement uh, for the acquisition of the iconic Aquil brand. Uh, and along with that, we have also purchased uh, the plant uh, at Bhuj Gujarat for a total consideration of 55 crores. Uh, to answer your question, currently, yes, the utilization levels are low uh, because of the balance sheet constraints that the target company had. But now with our financial muscle, we will be able to significantly increase the utilization uh, because the distribution network is already you know, deeply entrenched. So at peak capacity, uh, you know, we can manufacture around one lakh pieces per annum, uh, which translates to a revenue of around 100 to 120 crores uh, per annum. And also the total land bank is around eight acres and more than two thirds of the land is still available for future expansion. So once we completely spread out the asset, we would be uh, pumping in more capital to further scale uh, the bathware segment. Oh, interesting. So 120 crores, so approximately, uh, you know, you'll be spending 55 crores and getting an uh, asset turn of close to around, you know, 120 crores. Got that. Now, give us a few details. By when do you get to, to this optimum level? Do you think in FY26, FY25, if you could give us a rough number on that? And also, you know, what kind of margins will you enjoy on this acquired business? You also mentioned the scaling up plans. So by when do you take a call on that? Correct. So I think, you know, to, uh, to, to answer your question, you know, today we are a pioneer and the leader in our core segment, which is piping. And we want to replicate that success in the bathware segment. And this acquisition is, is key to that. So this deal helps us in three ways, basically. One is we get access uh, to a strong brand like Aquil, which has a very strong market recall, especially amongst key stakeholders like distributors, builders, architects. Uh, second, now we have in-house manufacturing at Hood. And third, we have now a deeply uh, entrenched distribution network for the bathware segment. So I think for the next two to three years, our focus will be uh, to use our financial muscle uh, as well as the brand to, to sweat out the asset. And I think over the next two to three years, only post that would we look to pump in more uh, capital to, to, to scale the business further. Uh, basically, this deal has just helped us accelerate our go-to-market for the bathware segment, which 
you know we have entered into only 6 months ago you want to give us the margin number as well sure so i think initially first 2 to 3 years we would be heavily investing in man- manpower and branding uh, but if i look at over the long term i think this business will have uh, superior margins to our current piping business as well so over the long term uh, you know 13 to 15% uh, ebitda margins uh, are sustainable once we hit a, a, a certain threshold mm, okay uh, near hi uh, good morning uh, prashant here so uh, <clears throat> round about in the range of what you make right now right in terms of uh, margins there could you tell us how is fourth quarter been uh for the business uh you know the, as as it st- stood before you made this acquisition because in the th- third quarter as well i mean there were the volume growth was a little weak as compared to some of the other players in the segment uh, i think you lost some market share as well uh has the fourth quarter seen any improvement yes so you know the, we had a erp transition going on which impacted our volumes uh but we are back on track and uh, you know we believe that the demand from the real estate and infrastructure segment will continue to deliver and i would also like to highlight that our eighth manufacturing facility for pipes is on track in bihar where we acquired 35 acres of land uh, from the bihar government uh we plan to invest uh, 220 crores uh to put up a capacity of more than 48000 tons per annum uh we expect to commercialize uh, commercial production from bihar um uh, in 12 months from today so quarter 4 um mm-hmm. and uh, we are aggressively putting up capacity not only in bathware but in our other two segments pipes and water tanks uh so our you know we are aggressively adding capacity across segments keeping in mind that the demand from real estate uh, and infrastructure not only in the current quarter but over the next 2 to 3 years uh, looks to be extremely healthy near uh, have you uh, two things one what is the capacity utilization as of now with our uh, of course the bihar capacity will uh, be important uh, what's the capacity utilization and in the fourth quarter uh, what's the market share uh, that you had across segments if you can give us a sense sure uh, so currently we are at around 60% capacity utilization uh in our business once you start reaching 70% capacity utilization uh you know that's peak so which is why we have been ahead of the curve with adding capacity in bihar which is going to be critical for growth in the eastern part of india which is growing at a, a fast pace and uh currently we are at around 7 to 8% market share in our core business which is piping so around 40000 crore uh market size uh, and we would be around 7 to 8% of that currently as we speak Our second vertical is water tanks. Total industry size would be around five thousand crores. We entered that segment uh, only two years ago, so we're still it's nascent times for us. And bathware today would be a fifteen to eighteen thousand crore uh, market size. So the total addressable market for us now becomes uh, around sixty thousand crores. And I think this is an opportune time for this kind of an uh, expansion with the way real estate and infrastructure demand tailwinds are coming. Can you just give us a final figure on the volume growth uh, what are you expecting to see and can you break it up for us between agri and non agri i didn't get that number so i'll stay away from quantifying growth in the middle of the quarter but i am happy to give a yeah. directional uh, view so the demand from non agri which is around 70% of our business continues to be strong uh, and demand was strong in the previous few quarters so only due mm-hmm. to our transition would it be uh, have some supply chain issues which are now completely resolved and behind us uh, and the rest of our portfolio around 30% which is which is agriculture we are also now seeing strong demand which is a seasonal business from jan to june but now that commodity prices of pvc are extremely low our finished good has become extremely affordable uh, which is another tailwind uh, for demand so with the tailwinds of real estate as well as affordability coming back in both raw material and finished good uh makes us you know more um aggressive and and bullish on demand going forward so i understand that you don't want to give us any uh, specific volumes but if you look at the trajectory right in terms of tons the last three quarters have seen a rise so there was 37000 tons in the q1 then it went to 40 and 41 by q4 do you think it will be better than the preceding three quarters just trying to understand the trend No, of course so quarter 4 is you know traditionally has always been the best quarter for us in, for the industry as well as for us and quarter 4 volumes will be uh, you know significantly higher than the first three quarters as well okay all right uh, we'll leave it there uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us near and uh, uh, 
great speaking with you and a, and a really good sense of the business as it stands right now. Good luck uh, to you uh, with the new, new acquisition and of course, uh, the uh, capacity expansion in Bihar that you spoke about as well. Now, Nazara Technologies is the next company uh, that we are engaging with. The company is set aside a war chest of $100 million for mergers, acquisitions in markets like India, Europe, North America. The company previously said that they expect F524 margins to be in the range of between 12 and 13%. Uh, Nitesh Mithilson is the Joint Managing Director and CEO at Nazara. He's joining us right now. Uh, thanks very much, Nitesh. Appreciate you joining in here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, it's good to speak with you, as always. Uh, you know, you also raised money uh, from uh, prominent individual investors and funds as well uh, through a PREF route. Could you talk to us about what exactly is on your mind in terms of uh, acquisitions? What space are we looking at? Uh, do you already have this chalked up in terms of what you want to do? Uh, and and uh, it's a matter of sort of, sort of doing it, uh, signing on the dotted line. Just give us a sense. Yes, of course. As you know, we raised uh, 760 crores in recent months and the company was already well capitalized. Uh, I think at a consolidated level, we have, you know, in excess of 1500 crores of cash. So very well poised to, uh, you know, continue to acquire and build, which has been a strategy over the last few years, which has been quite successful as well. Especially right now, we are finding a lot of opportunities in the Western markets. I'm here in San Francisco attending uh, GDC, which is the largest gaming conference that happens. And there's quite a lot of interest uh, to work with Nazara. So I think, uh, you know, especially focused on gaming studios, similar to the Wildworks acquisition that we had done last year, we are seeing, uh, you know, the similar playbook can be replicated with slightly larger studios, which we are pretty actively focusing on building a pipeline. And hopefully in the coming quarter, Q1, latest Q2, we should be in a position to close some deals. Deal, oh. not uh, not deal, right? Deals. So more than one. And uh, uh, Hopefully so. And uh, in, in what space, if you can, without, of course, uh, not getting any sp uh, more specific, but in what space? Gaming, right? And uh, what would be the size broadly? How much would you spend uh, towards these deals? Sure. So I think uh, we've earmarked... Uh, as you would have read, uh, about 100 million US dollars or equivalent to a little over 800 crores in INR uh, to you know invest in these opportunities. From a target perspective, we are looking at uh, game studios that are you know profitable, generating good cash flows and own gaming IP, very similar to the Animal Jam IP we picked up last year. I think that's uh, turned out pretty well for us. And we've now got a playbook that we can replicate at a slightly larger scale. In terms of uh, revenues, we're looking at businesses or studios that are at least 100 crores in revenue, but could mm -hmm. be anywhere from uh, 100 to 250 crores in revenue with a you know, profit, uh, with a EBITDA margin in excess of 15 to 20%. Okay, all right. Hi, Nitesh. Good morning and good to see you in. I hope you're having a good conference, as you told us, plenty of interest out there. I want to ask you about two possible acquisition targets. One is on Smash, you know, reports are indicating that y'all are interested via the, uh, you know, the insolvency route, I think so. So tell us, uh, uh, give us an update on that. And also the last time we chatted, you know, briefly asked you about Delta's online gaming business. Are you all interested? Yes. Are there any kind of talks that have taken place so far? Sure. So with respect to offline entertainment, we do believe or we are building a thesis where we think that there could be convergence between, you know, gaming online and gaming offline. And uh, that kind of piqued our interest in uh, Smash. Uh, we have, uh, you know, applied in the NCLT process and we'll see how that pans out in the process over the next uh, few weeks or months. As far as uh, your question around Delta is concerned, generally, if you remember, you know, the online RMG space or the real money gaming space has gone through a turbulence and uh, more clarity is you know coming out especially on the going forward taxation etc so we are in talks with uh, multiple parties uh, you know in that space uh, to see how we can synergize and how we can build a larger business on the real money gaming front going forward uh, so uh, definitely looking at all the opportunities over there and delta's business would also be on your radar then it, it possibly could be <laughs> okay um, we'll wait by to hear more on that. Um, Nitesh, thanks a lot for joining in. I wanted to talk a little bit about Classic Rummy as well. Over there, you've recorded an EBITDA loss in the quarter gone by. 
Uh, is it still yes. loss making and is that the expectation as we move along into FY25 as well? I think uh, the business has seen uh, improvement. You know, there may be a marginal loss of profit in this uh, quarter. But for us, I think the bigger picture is what's the scale up opportunity in RMG. Uh, Classic Rami is just, uh, you know, 50, 60 crore business for us contributes less than 2, 3% of the overall revenues. Mm. Uh, so it's really meant to, it was really originally meant to be a toe in the door when the market opens up. And okay. uh, can we use that as a consolidation vehicle, uh, you know, as a scale up in RMG, something we are exploring. We're still, mm. still some away from doing something significant there, but we're definitely uh, quite excited about what could be the potential in the future. So what can be the potential, Nitish? I'm still trying to understand, you know, RMG, I mean, it, it hasn't been doing as well so far for you, but you're talking about the opportunities and we've been speaking about this for a while. Uh, over the next two to three years, particularly in RMG, what could the scale-up opportunity be for Nazara? Yeah, look, uh, as has been seen in India, the skill-based real money gaming has scaled up significantly in terms of monetization, in terms of, uh, you know, the share of revenues of gaming, it has by far the largest share. Nazara over the years took a conservative view because we were waiting for more clarity on how this business is going to be regulated and how it is going to be taxed. In October last year, you know, the policy that came out on GST kind of uh, gave, I think, much more clarity, at least on the going forward taxation on this business. And that now gives us more confidence in terms of, you know, moving ahead. In the last few months after that uh, announcement, we have been waiting for the market to settle because a lot of the businesses have got reset, the business models have got adjusted, so we didn't want to rush into it. But I think in uh, the calendar year of 2024, uh, we may see good opportunities to look at this uh, scale up. And once we enter it, I think in terms of our revenue contribution could go up significantly from the 2-3% that it is there today. Okay. All right. Um, so that is on Real Money Gaming, right? I also want to talk a little bit about the publishing division. You went live with your inaugural set of games. Uh, what is the kind yes. of traction that you've seen so far and what's the scope over there? It's still very early days uh, to give any specific numbers and it'll take some time to scale. But what I'm definitely seeing is that global game developers are very interested in uh, the Indian gaming market. They see, you know, a 500 million uh, users market still uh, picking up on monetization but a lot of the large players globally want to enter and i think nazara can be a great partner for them in the indian market you know to build uh, local uh, live operations and really scaling up their games in the indian market so we are investing in local game ecosystem investing and working with local game developers but you will also see in 24 uh, us uh, partner with many global gaming uh, players to kind of publish their games in India. So this is a long-term play for Nazara, not an immediate large monetization uh, play, but I think it's very important for us as a, you know, being very strong in the Indian gaming market as a local player. This is a very strategic move for us. All right, Nitish, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and speaking to us. All the best with your, uh, you know, expansion in the RMG, the real money gaming business and the m and opportunities over there. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side of the break, we'll put focus on the commodity space. Manisha Gupta joins in. Okay, welcome back. Uh, you've got the market, which has now moved up even more. Uh, we started with 150, 160 point higher start. Make that 200 now. Look at that. Uh, and uh, this is a sharp acceleration on the way up that we are uh, picking up. And, you know, earlier we were talking about the possibility of that building on the gains that we start with. Mitesh was uh, echoing that sentiment as well. He's back with us. Mitesh, uh, your thoughts, uh, the day so far, the hour so far, as I should say, and what would your trades be? It's been a nice hour, I think, you know, we, as I said, I think, you know, today, because yesterday, you know, there was some signal on the bank Nifty, which was suggesting that a reversal could happen. We have seen a very strong follow through on the bank, banking names and banking stocks. So I think uh, the intraday charts, the hourly, the two early charts suggest that we could see levels of 47, 200 on the spot bank Nifty, which is another 300 points away. And 
in case things go even better, 47, 700, 750 zones could also be tested. So I maintain a positive bias. On the stock side, uh, BHL is something, you know, which has come on the radar. So keep a stop at about levels of uh, 227. Look for targets of 245 here to begin with. And the other one which I like is uh, uh, HDFC Bank. It's been underperforming, but I think this could pick up now. There are some signs of reversal. So take a very tight stop at uh, 14, uh, 1435. Look for targets of 1475. All right. Thanks a lot, Mitesh, for that. Let's go across to Manisha Gupta now. She's going to tell us about the commodity markets. Manisha, what's the one commodity you're tracking today? Oh, it's going to be gold because we're looking at all-time highs onto this one yet again. So we've seen 3% of gains in gold in this week itself. Gold actually has been hitting all-time high for most part of last fortnight. And in the last one month, we've gained more than 10% for the precious metal prices there. Also, when you look at uh, the prices within the year of January, either the, the year of 2024, rather, we started with $2,058 and of an ounce. So we started on a higher note itself. And then we saw some profit taking. So 1992 was the low that the gold prices made in the month of Feb and we are trading at 2200 right now. The all-time high until now has been $2,220 an ounce. Not just gold, silver prices also have been running up. We are trading at a 15-week highs onto this one. So silver price has gained 2.5% overnight, 4% in this week and has gained 13% in the last one month as well. Markets are looking at stronger buying, especially after the US Fed meeting, which has indicated three rate cuts in 2024. So that's 75 basis points is what the street is working with. Also, the dollar index and Treasury yields have declined that supported many of the metal buying that we've seen in Asia right now. And with after the U.S. Fed meeting, the, uh, the Fed tools are now pricing in 73% of a probability of a rate cut for the month of June there. This is higher from 65%. That was before the U.S. Fed meeting announcement came in. Safe haven buying geopoliticals always has had supported in gold, and that's what's happening right now as well. Apart from that, it also has to do with the central bank gold buying, especially in China, Poland, Singapore, Libya. I mean, these are some of the top buyers in sense of central bank buying in gold. India is on the fifth number there. There also is strong retail buying that you have seen in China and Turkey. So on the spot, there's a lot of on-ground demand coming into the markets. If you look at the forward-looking in sense of prices now, we have City, ANZ, and Saxo Bank all talking about 23 hundred dollars an ounce is what they're anticipating in the second half of this year. This will happen when you actually see rate cuts happen. But there have been various other forecasts as well from 2200 to 2250. Most bullish coming in from JP Morgan, they believe if the, crew, if the gold prices cross above 2300, then 2500 of a possibility in this year is what they're working with. Okay, so gold prices, you said 22 dollars an ounce. So what does this mean in terms of the MCX gold rate? Has it... Uh... Cross 65,000 already? Oh my God, Sonia, we're trading at 66,700, wow. which is an all-time high. And yes, there are conversations about 70,000 being hit in this year itself. Wow, 10 mm. grams of gold yes. at 66,700 rupees per 10 grams. Wow, big move coming in there. Thanks a lot, Manisha, for joining in. So that's the big headline, really. Gold prices at record highs. But expect to end FY24 in a growth trajectory that no one in the history of global aviation has ever seen. These are the words coming in. From Akasa Air founder and CEO Vinay Dubey, he also talked about their plans for international expansion and much more. Listen in. We have foreign government permissions uh, that are involved and sometimes these foreign governments take three months, sometimes it takes four months or five months. We've made this application uh, a little while ago uh, and so I would say it's imminent uh, and, uh, and you know my thought is hopefully we'll get all our permissions in place uh, for Riyadh, Jeddah and Kuwait, like we did for Qatar uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. But I'm unable to give you a specific answer. It's, it's not nine months, it's not one year, uh, you know, hopefully a lot shorter than that. Uh, right. Perhaps later this summer. I, I will say, uh, you know, two things in terms of finishing FY24. One is, uh, you know, financially and from a cash perspective in an extremely strong position. So that's the one thing you know, I will say that we built this, you know, rock solid foundation when it comes to both the business model and when it comes to being capitalized uh, and cash. And that's one way we expect to end FY24. And the second way is, you know, in, in a growth trajectory that no other history in global aviation has ever seen. And the third thing is we expect to end FY. I know I said two, but I've got the third. We expect to end FY24 as India's most on-time and most reliable airline. We're not, not worried based on our delivery schedule. We've been able to work things out 
with Boeing to the point where the delivery is going to meet our expectations and is going to uh, allow us to continue to be India's you know, fastest growing airline. Uh, so I'd say that uh, you know, lots of growth, lots of international flying, lots of growth opportunities for our employees is how we expect FY25 to look like. Rakasa has no shortage of pilots, right? We've got 700 pilots here. We're extremely pleased uh, with the way in we've been able to attract and retain our pilots. Uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, really because of the modern generation aircraft that we have, which is the aircraft of the future, and pilots, you know, would like to make a career out of that particular aircraft. It's because of the employee-centric stand that we've taken, uh, you know, the rigor with which we, we train pilots. And so, you know, there's a variety of reasons why we've been able to attract and retain a number of pilots. And like I said, we have almost to the T-700 pilots. Okay, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick commercial break on that note. Uh, you can catch the full conversation with the Akasa management all day today on CNBC TV 18. Let's take a break. On the other side, we will connect with the management of NLC India to discuss their business, the recent OFS and the outlook going forward. Welcome back uh, to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, NLC India is the next management on the show. The government recently sold 7% stake. Prasanna Kumar Motupalli, who is the Chairman and Managing Director at NLC India, joins us now uh, to talk more about that. Uh, Mr. Motupalli, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time out to speak to uh, CNBC TV 18. If you can just, you know, start by telling us about um, a couple of things that uh, recently went through with the company. Uh, you've received this uh, particular order for uh, from iFox Wind Technique. Um, you all received an LOA from uh, they received an LOA from NLC India for the restoration of 33 WTGs. Can you tell us a li little bit about what was the earlier status of the power plant and what does this particular order pertain to? Uh, good morning, madam. Uh, actually, we and NLC was having uh, uh, 51 megawatt wind uh, power stations in the state of Tamil Nadu. And uh, they are old uh, wind machines, and there are some issues with the availability of these machines. So, complete uh, revamping and upgradation of uh, these uh, wind turbines is awarded. And uh, with this, uh, the um, capacity utilization factor of these uh, wind turbines will improve after implementation of this revamping plan. Hmm. Okay, so can you tell us what does this mean? I mean, what was the earlier status of the power plant, and uh, what what would this mean for you for in terms of the way forward? Uh, because of uh, this uh, revamping and uh, upgradation, mm. the capacity utilization factor of uh, uh, windmill will improve, and uh, the generation from the uh, windmill will also improve. Okay, mm. <clears throat> Mr. Mudupoli, hi. Good morning, uh, Prashant here. You know, there, uh, another bit of news, actually, there's been a lot happening, right? Uh, so you signed a MOU with Rajasthan for the formation of a joint venture for thermal and renewable capacity. Uh, could you provide us with some details? I mean, what exactly uh, is this joint venture going to do? What are you going to do in this joint venture? Uh, you know, there's uh, some total cap uh, capex of 7,000 crores, which has been uh, sort of assigned. Uh, where, where will this be used? How will this be funded? What are the timelines for pro any projects that you will build under this JV? Actually, as you know, already NLC India Limited is having one uh, mine, lignite mine, and uh, uh, power station in the state of Rajasthan, and that is Barsing Sir Thermal Power Station. And it is supplying the cheapest power to the state of Rajasthan already, and is powering the growth story of Rajasthan. Uh, as you know, NL, uh, Rajasthan is having a uh, uh, huge reserves of lignite and NLC is having uh, uh, experience of uh, installation of lignite plant. To uh, take advantage of this, uh, JV is being formed for setting up of 125 megawatt lignite based power plant uh, uh, in the state of Rajasthan and uh, 1000 megawatt uh, solar power plant uh, also is being planned to take the advantage of the high solar uh, radiation that is available in uh, the state of Rajasthan. Uh, this 7,500 crores we, have, uh, we will be spending on this, uh, this 124, 125 megawatt lignite-based power station 
we'll, we will be spending around 1500 crores and for this 1000 megawatt uh, solar power plant we will be spending 6000 uh, crores so we we are taking up all the actions uh, to start the activities at the earliest and uh, I think uh, the lignite based power station is next four or five years that will be completed. And this 1000 megawatt solar power plant in next uh, two years period that will be completed. And the, the entire 7500 megawatt will be spent in next uh, four or five years. Mm. 7500 crores, okay. Uh, now, this is, uh, <clears throat> will there be investment from the government of Rajasthan as well? Or this is just, I mean, an agreement for them to p buy power? These, be, these will be long term uh -huh. agreements. <laughs> It is a JV, JVB that will be operated by NLC. It will be uh, the majority stake will be of NLC, and there will be some minority stake from uh, uh, Rajasthan uh, government. No, this uh, the seven thousand five hundred seven thousand odd crores. This is an in investment by NLC, and there will be something which will be put in by the government as well. No, this actually seven thousand five hundred crores is the total investment total. that is okay. being okay. uh, total for the okay. uh, projects. And out of that, the majority stake will be NLC and uh, the other stake will be Rajasthan. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to the business in a bit. The other thing we wanted to talk about was the government selling 7% stake in NNC via the OFS route. Just wanted to understand any more divestment from the government planned in this calendar year itself. Uh, and have there been any discussions on that front? Uh, no, Madam, actually, uh, this uh, investment was mainly to meet, uh, meet the 19 year regulation of LADR uh, of uh, public holding of uh, more than 25%. Uh, um, uh, uh, I don't foresee any further disinvestment uh, immediately. Okay, no further disinvestment, got it. Uh, with onboarding of new capacities, what is the proportion of merchant sales volumes as a part of the overall mix, if you can tell us? And how are merchant rates trending currently? Uh, Madam, as on date, our uh, entire uh, power is uh, tied up. We don't have any other any uh, merchant power uh, based power plant. Uh, but uh, whenever there is uh, um, no schedule from the uh, respective beneficiaries, we are uh, uh, taking this to the market and uh, able to sell that with reasonable prices. But uh, for merchant uh, uh, power selling, we don't have any specific power plants. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, uh, got that. Now, uh, just one uh, thing. You, you know, you're expected to commission two gigawatts of thermal capacity at Ghatampur and new mining capacity up to F525. Uh, could you uh, could, could you tell uh, tell us by the end of F five twenty five that is the next financial year the end of the next financial year what should be the total capacity uh, for NLC India? See, as on date we are a six gigawatt company. Uh, one point four out of that one point four gigawatt is renewable capacity. So in the financial year twenty uh, four twenty five. Uh, we will be commissioning the entire uh, two gigawatt capacity at the Gatampur and uh, 300 uh, megawatt uh, of uh, solar at uh, Rajasthan and 150 megawatt hybrid power project at uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat. So, in the uh, financial year 24-25, we will be adding uh, approximately 2450 megawatt. Out of that, 2000 megawatt will be at Dharam, Gatampur and um, around 450 megawatt renewables in the state of Gujarat and Rajasthan. Okay, okay. Uh, gives us a good sense. Uh, so, you'd, you'd basically be about at, at about 8.5 gigawatts by the end of F525, right? In terms of operational capacity. Uh, exactly. Got it, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. Good speaking with you and good luck. Uh, always great to speak with you here on CNBC TV 18. You know, the market's up uh, 200 plus points at about 22,060. IRB infrastructure is the stock which is actually uh, in focus. It's buzzing. There's a positive note from Kotak Equities. Vivek is here with exactly that. Vivek. Well, that's right. Uh, so, you know, IRB Infra, if you recall, on March 14th had informed the exchanges that there was a secondary stake sale as far as the private invit was concerned. And this had got the market excited because that had, that had given a value discovery 
as far as the private invitor is concerned. Remember, IRB holds 51% stake over there. Post that, the IRB infra, you know, the management went to a multiple sell side and there have been notes that have been coming along. Today, a very interesting note from Kotak Institutional Equity. They've gone ahead and upgraded the stock to an ad rating from the earlier sell stance that they had. They've raised the target price to, to 65 rupees from 60 rupees earlier. So what is it? Number one, you know, they've gone ahead and uh, reacted to this particular deal. They are saying that this particular deal values the private invit at 40,700 crore, which means that IRP's implied value in this particular invit is 20,400 crore, giving it uh, almost 34 rupees a share value just from IRB's stake as far as its private invit is concerned. Secondly, what they're quite positive on is that they're saying that the road sector itself is witnessing a change as far as ordering activity is concerned. They're saying that ordering uh, from NHI has now shifted to the TOT as well as the BOT projects and they are seeing visibility of close to 44,000 crore worth of BOT projects in the pipeline. They believe IRB is well placed to go ahead and capitalize on these particular project and awarding opportunities given the fact that amongst most of the infra companies, IRB has a much stronger balance sheet. On the back of that, today they've gone ahead and upgraded the stock. Okay, thanks a lot for that. That's IRB Infra, the big mover right now, 9% higher. By the way, the market is also in great position right now. The Nifty holding on to 22,000, up 200 points, and the mid-cap index is up 800 points. Um, is the worst of the market fall behind us? Maybe too soon to tell, but for now, we're just enjoying the gains that we have on our hands. At least the bulls are enjoying it for now. With that, it's a wrap on Bazaar. Chartbusters coming up next. Stay tuned. Welcome to AU